five so
It's like a chip.
Former President George Herbert Walker Bush will be laid to rest today in College Station, Texas, on the grounds of the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum. This morning, a funeral service at St. Martin's Episcopal Church in Houston, Texas. You're looking at live images now from inside St. Martin's as congregants gather to mourn and celebrate the life of the 41st president. Welcome to live coverage from The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey, and I'm joined on set this morning by journalist and author Sally Quinn. Welcome, Sally. And our special guest, Bill Plant, longtime Washington correspondent. Thanks so much to both of you for being here. You both have such long histories yourselves in Washington. Um, witnessing history, reporting on history, being a part of history, frankly. Um, I, I, I want to hear your perspectives on what to expect today versus yesterday. We had this state funeral yesterday at National Cathedral. Today, we see the Bush family gather along with so many friends and longtime colleagues in Houston. Bill, what is the difference between these two days for you? This is the day that George H.W. Bush goes home, uh, both literally and figuratively. He'll be buried at his library. And the work that he has done will be the subject of study for years to come. So in every sense, this is the final commitment. He's gone home to Texas, the, the state that he adopted deliberately as a very young man, and came to love. So he's there, and his work is there, and will live on. Sally, um, expectations for today and, and what you witnessed yesterday? Well, yesterday was a national affair. Um, uh, George Bush yesterday belonged to the country, in fact, to the world. I mean, the National Cathedral is the National Cathedral, and it's where all of the great moments of state happen. Um, when he goes back to Texas, it's going to be much more uh, a much more familial scene. Uh, the only two speakers, his closest friend and his grandson, whereas yesterday you had, uh, you know, you had speakers who were much more well-known, world leaders and historians and, um, and, his, and his son, uh, the president. Uh, so I think that it, it, if, the, if I can use the word cozy, I think tomorrow will be a, co I mean, today will be a cozier day. Yesterday was a, a day of grandeur. I mean, you can't be in the National Cathedral and not have that sense of grandeur because it is so big and so imposing and you and and you have a sense of history there whereas today it's it's his personal church so it's not as much a sense of history as it is a sense of family Let's go over the rundown of, of what's happening today. This has been so many days, national days, of uh, recognition of the life and service of President George H.W. Bush, and it all ends today. Uh, the funeral service is scheduled to take place in about a half an hour at St. Martin's Episcopal Church, and then afterwards the casket will depart St. Martin's and go to the Union Pacific Railroad, the Westfield Auto Facility, where it will go by train uh, to Texas A&M. And this, of course, is the location of the Presidential Library and Museum. Bill, this is where Barbara Bush is buried. Not Houston. only Barbara Bush, but also their child, uh, <clears throat> Robin, who died at age three of leukemia, and whose loss they really never recovered from. Mm. They talked about it, thought about it forever, as you, as you heard at some length yesterday. So the three of them will be together uh, at the library, and that is certainly the way H.W. Bush wanted it. Uh, one of the most touching moments yesterday was when former President George W. Bush just started to break down at the end of his eulogy as he envisioned his father being welcomed by Robin and Barbara. Um, such an emotional moment. I, I want to point out the Texas governor is now arriving. Uh, we'll be seeing a lot of faces um, from, from years of Texas politics as well as national politics. Sally, what does the choice to be buried at, uh, at the Presidential Library say to you and the decision to have Barbara there as well? Um, talk to us about that. Well, I mean, obviously, that the, the library and, and the, the, they chose to have the library there because it was important to him. Um, and certainly, they were all going to be buried together. And um, I think, you know, I think when Bill is right that the the death of Robin, the three-year-old daughter, was something that was always on their mind. And I know that um, I, I had a relationship with Barbara Bush that she, we almost never didn't talk about Robin whenever we were together. I had a son wow. who was very sick for a long time and nearly died uh, uh, several times. And, and when I would see Barbara, she would ro just put her arms around me. And some one night, she at the vice president's 
mansion, she, the tears rolled down her eyes when I told her that Quinn was in the hospital and we weren't sure he was going to make it, you know. And, um, and she just said, I know what it is. I just, I know what that loss is. Um, and so to, to have them all buried together, I think, is hugely meaningful. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and particularly for the whole family. I mean, this was, that Robin's death was uh, a moment in their lives that probably was a defining moment for, for the whole family. Even, even the, though George W. and Jeb were tiny, it, was, it still had a huge impact on them, her death, because and it did on the parents. Even more so because, as in the case with your son, there were periods when it appeared that she might get better. Right, exactly, yeah. But she did not. No. Mm -hmm. uh, so amazing that she was able to generously share of her experiences and not just lock it away, but talk about it, relate to other parents, as we've heard stories over the last few days of President Bush doing the same thing, you know, tearing up when he met children who were sick and, and battling cancer, supporting a Secret Service agent's son um, who was battling leukemia by shaving his head along with the rest of his Secret Service agents in support of a boy who lost his hair? You know, I when um, the, right after the he was elected and before he, the inauguration, there was an event at at uh, Nash, uh, the uh, Kennedy Center, and my husband, my then husband Ben Bradley, and I were in the receiving line. And she came through the receiving line. She grabbed my hand, and she leaned over and she said to me, "Please be kind to him." To he's George my, W. Bush. He's my son. <laughs> Like, I know you have a son, yeah. and you know, and, and because I'm a journalist, and it was, don't take out after him. I mean, even if I had wanted to, I could never have written a bad word about him because, you know, she, we had that bond. And I, and when she said, please be kind to him, I just sort of thought, oh, my God. <laughs> that has spoken through a mother's heart. Barbara Bush was very good at, at uh, reaching out to people. She reached out to a group of journalists when he was vice president uh, who were in the residence for a Christmas party, herded us all together on a sofa, and produced the family. And it was very obvious that this was uh, a little nudge that, yes, he's going, to, he's going to run for president, and I want you boys all to sit, and they were all boys, sit down there and just listen. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be seeing the Bush family represented today in the eulogies. Grandson, uh, George P. Bush, will be offering up one of the eulogies today. Let's head down to St. Martin's Episcopal Church in Houston, where my colleague Lee Powell is outside. Good morning, Lee. Well, good morning, Libby, from uh, St. Martin's Episcopal Church here uh, on the uh, west side of Houston. Um, I will tell you this. I uh, stayed last night to see uh, the president's body arrive here at the church. They did have an arrival uh, ceremony uh, when he arrived. They were running about 45 minutes to an hour behind schedule by the time they left Washington, landed here at Ellington Field, which is in south uh, East Houston, and then had to make their way through the infamous Houston rush hour traffic uh, to get to the church here on the west side. But that happened uh, roughly uh, about 6.30 when the arrival uh, ceremony happened. There was a, uh, an honor guard. Uh, the band played Hail to the Chief and our, um, also Our God, Our Help in Ages Past, that uh, great Isaac Watts hymn. And the casket uh, was brought inside. And I actually went inside shortly after that. About 7 is when the public started coming in uh, to the sanctuary. The procedure here was that people could not show up at the, uh, here at the church. They had to go to a, a second Baptist church. Uh, about a mile down the road, get security cleared, get on buses, and then come back to the church here to uh, see him lying in repose and pay the respects. And I have to say it was a very somber mood inside, very silent except for the occasional quick click or whirling of a camera. Uh, the, the time that I was in there, uh, there was a group of Boy Scouts in uniform who stopped in front of the casket and gave their scout salute. There was also some uh, sailors and some members of the Marine, also, Marines also in uniform, who filed by uh, almost one by one stopping, coming up in front of the casket, doing a, a, a military turn, and then giving a salute to the casket, and then moving on. So each member of that contingent did the same. Um, when people left the, uh, left the uh, lying in repose moment, everyone here uh, got this card. And what it is is basically the president's portrait uh, on the front, and then in the back, a short 
biographical history with a little word from the family saying they deeply appreciate the prayers and kindness uh, being brought together to celebrate uh, his life. So a little memento from everyone uh, who uh, came here to see him lying in repose. So that happened roughly from 7 o'clock last night to 6 o'clock uh, time this morning. So well into all, all overnight. Uh, and they say that there are about 12,000 people that uh, made it uh, through security to the buses to see him lying in repose, filing past here. And I'll leave you with this. One woman did tell one of the local TV stations that it was beautiful and sad all at the same time. So that kind of captures the mood, the sentiment here uh, last night into today when, of course, the private funeral is taking place. Let me back to you. Lee Powell outside the church. Uh, my colleague Nicole Ellis has been in Texas this week talking to Texans, um, hearing stories about how President George H.W. Bush touched the lives of people there. And she joins us now this morning from College Station. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Libby. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm outside of the President Bush Library and Museum. And, you know, it's important to kind of put this into context and really think about how odd and significant Texas became for President Bush. He didn't go to A&M. He went to Yale University. And he presided over Houston for the vast majority of his political life here in Texas. So he passed over offers from Rice University and the University of Houston, not to mention the other schools that are around us that are so popular, University of Texas, to name one. Um, but, you know, President Bush has been described as someone who just had an affinity for the spirit of A&M and is known to not only spend time uh, at the university, hanging out with students, but he he skydove onto the campus three times, um, and uh, you know he'll be joining Barbara and and his daughter Robin here later today. Uh, but I think one of the most charming uh, memories many people recall of President Bush is his love of fishing at the pond behind his library and museum. Uh, so we'll be keeping that in mind today. It is a bit of a somber day here, but a special one where he'll be rejoining uh, his beloved wife and daughter. Back to you, Libby. Nicole Ellis in College Station at the site of the Presidential Library. So we're looking at these live images as congregants have gathered at St. Martin's. Uh, we saw James Baker a few moments ago. He'll be delivering one of the two eulogies. Um, Bill, what does it mean to have these two people, James Baker, longtime loyal aide who served many roles under the administrations of, uh, of Reagan and Bush, and also George Prescott Bush, grandson, son of Jeb, uh, delivering the other eulogy. Well, these two guys bookend one another in many ways. James A. Baker is, was George H.W. Bush's closest friend. They met uh, when they were in their 20s and looking for tennis partners in Houston. And they found each other, and Baker stuck with uh, the president all through his, uh, his uh, political career. Tried to get him on the ticket in 1980, failed, and then went to work for Ronald Reagan, but then went straight back to work for, uh, for Bush. And they were, I, I once uh, happened to be within earshot of a telephone conversation that Baker was having with the president, President Bush. And they weren't talking like a subordinate to a boss. They were talking like two buddies, two, two pals, two bros, if you will. Uh, and George P. represents uh, the Bush clan hopes, I think, the future. He is the up and coming, uh, you know, 40 something uh, guy who's starting in a procession of public service jobs. Now he's Texas land commissioner. That could lead anywhere. And there's been much talk that someday he too will be a Bush running for president. Yeah, one of the few who's gotten into politics has really gotten in that in that in that political realm in the next generation of Bushes, Sally. Well, I think he's definitely being groomed um, by the family as the, as the next generation. It doesn't seem like the um, George W's two daughters either want to go into politics, and he's got the name, and he's certainly got the resume now. I mean, from the Aiken Gump Law firm and land commissioner and, uh, you know, he's involved in all kinds of politics. I think the interesting thing is that he is a Trump supporter and um, I, he must be holding his nose uh, to, to be that, but um, as Bill pointed out earlier, you know, if you're in Texas, you, you, you've got to support Trump if you want to get anywhere. Uh, but I think, I, I suspect that within the next year or two, he will break out. I, he, there's been no talk of him running in 2020, but I suspect that, that he's got his eye on 24. I, that would be my guess. 
at any rate. Um, but and, and James Baker is uh, he's really a good old boy. And uh, I, I've known him for years when he first came to Washington. He was when his first wife died. He was 38, mm -hmm. and um, the Bushes were the first people there. And he basically was said to them, "I don't really want to live anymore." And he said, and George H. Uh, w. Bush said, "Come and work for me." And he did start working for him. Um, <clears throat> and I think he ran his Senate campaign. He did. And, he, <clears throat> and 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 he was always his sort of honcho. And um, I, I remember a, a couple of times when when George H. W. was president. And there was something the Washington Post was going to run that they didn't like. It was always Jim Baker who would call my husband Ben Bradley, who was then the editor of the paper, and say, "Come on, Ben, you know you can't, you can't run this." And at one point, Ben said, "Okay, okay, George. I mean, uh, Jim, we won't run it." And he 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 calls Ben up later and he says, "Bradley, you've done a noble thing." <laughs> 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 you know? But but there was you know there was a real camaraderie between Baker and the, the press. I mean, mm -hmm. the press loved him, the journalists loved him, and people loved uh, George H.W. Bush. I mean, I know he had this <clears throat> sort of um, uh, sort of contentious relationship with some of the journalists. I mean, Maureen Dowd wrote a wonderful piece mm -hmm. about him, and Anne Devroy, who was a reporter for The Post, who, um, who died of cancer, and he was basically there for her when she died, even though she'd written some negative things about him. Um, and Evan Thomas, who wrote the Wimp Factor story for Newsweek magazine, but but basically people really loved him, and uh, he was a wonderful person. You couldn't not like him. Sally, I was asking you about your time covering Washington and and, and the Bush era, and you pointed out that the Bush era was a long time. I mean, we don't talk about, I think a lot of Americans think about a, a one-term president, but he was here for so many iterations and, and so many uh, career steps from directing the CIA to serving for eight years as vice president onto the presidency. And then when George W. Bush was in office, I mean, we saw sort of a new resurgence of, right. of the Bush community, those who'd worked with him and worked for uh, his father coming back to town. So what was that Washington like? How was well, it different I mean, than he, today? And he was ambassador to China. Yeah. He was UN ambassador. He, you know, he started out as a congressman. I first met the Bushes almost 50 years ago when I first started working for the Washington Post. Wow. And I was covering a congressional uh, picnic. And uh, I was lost. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know, you know, I was brand new. And I, I somehow ended up talking to them. And Barbara Bush said, well, let me, you know, um, why don't I, we introduce you to some people. And they took me around the whole congressional picnic and introduced me to everybody. I mean, they didn't know me. Uh, it, was, I, it was just the most generous thing I can imagine. So I've had that, that relationship with them. But yeah, they were very much part of Washington. Mm. Um, I mean, they, you know, and, and of course in those days, there were a, a lot of the people who were in power were the old WASP families and the preppies and the people who went to Harvard and Yale and Princeton. And so they were, they were just very much part of that community. Uh, and and they, 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 they were never outsiders, even though they had moved to Texas. They really were from Connecticut. And because his father, George Prescott Bush, had been a senator, uh, you know, they, they, they couldn't have been more, in, more insider than they were. I think uh, that's a really important point that you raised. They never were outsiders. And that, mm -hmm. I think, is what eventually disconnected the president, President Bush, from a large part of the American public. He seemed to be, to many people, an aristocrat, yes. which didn't help at all. Yes, well, he was an aristocrat. And, um, you know, frankly, I think aristocrats get bad, a bad name, <laughs> you know, because I think that people are born into a certain family, you, you know, whether you're born a, an aristocrat or you're, you know, you're an immigrant, you're still an American. And I, I, I think that there's been a lot of, uh, 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 you know, a lot of negative coverage about people who've been born to privilege, even though someone like George Bush, H.W. Bush, um, having been born to privilege, was also born to believe that, you know, you must leave a life of service. And he did lead a life of service. What we're hearing from inside the church right now, some of the basic instructions of uh, turn off your cell phones and, and, and things like that, so uh, you're not missing anything as we can keep talking. Style is reverent. 
And so it is our um, typical, our tradition that people, as we prepare for the service, uh, begin to um, think and pray, not visit with one another. Uh, as tempting as that may be, uh, you'll have some time to do that when the service comes to a close. There'll be some instructions at the end of the service about how you'll be leaving today, and I'll, I'll wait. That moment Funeral scheduled to begin in about 10 minutes time here at uh, at the church in Houston, Texas. This is St. Martin's uh, and it is such a, a, a Texan gathering and a family gathering for the Bushes here. As we mentioned, we'll see eulogies today from James Baker and also George P. Bush, a grandson of George Herbert Walker Bush. I'm Libby Casey. I'm joined on set here uh, by Bill Plant and Sally Quinn. And we'll bring you the funeral live and uninterrupted when it kicks off at 11 o'clock. Sally, you were just mentioning sort of the aristocratic uh, gifts, but also in some ways baggage that George H.W. Bush brought to office, especially in the 90s when Americans were really hungry for something different and Bill Clinton was able to beat him and he didn't win a second term. So many of the stories that, that lived on that were critical of Bush from, from that campaign era, he didn't know how to use a grocery store scanner, he was out of touch with Americans, over time really snowballed and were taken out of context and, and weren't really true. Like, the man knew how to use a grocery store scanner, but there was something about those stories that Americans bought into because it, it did confirm their suspicions that he was out of touch. He wasn't the Bill Clinton, I feel your pain. Um, he wasn't the kind of person who could directly relate to Americans in that, in that same very visceral, open, emotional way, Bill. He kept his emotions more to himself. Well, I think that you, you, um, they were two very different personalities mm -hmm. more than, I, more than their, their backgrounds. I mean, George H.W. Bush was probably the most empathetic person. I've ever met. I mean, he really did connect to people. He really did connect to people's pain. Um, but he was of a different generation, and he was of that New England, you know, where you you don't show your emotions. I mean, the, uh, one of the big differences was in in the religion. His father. I mean, he was a an Episcopalian, and he was a devout Episcopalian. But you didn't talk about your faith. Mm -hmm. and, and Bill Clinton did a little bit, but I mean, when Jimmy Carter first came to Washington and he said, you know, he was a born again Christian, everybody died laughing. You know, it was, it was like, what is he thinking to talk about this? Because this is something you don't talk about. Now, those were the old days before people did talk about their faith. Um, and, and so it was, a, it was a whole different period, a whole different era. When George W. came in, he said, you know, he was born again, that mm -hmm. he had, you know, had a, when I was young and irresponsible, I was young and irresponsible. And he had a drinking problem. And then when he was 40, he came to Jesus. And Billy Graham helped take, take him over to the other side and he stopped drinking. And, and he was able to talk about that in a way unashamedly and, and uh, w without any embarrassment, whereas George H.W. Bush really kept to himself in that way. And I, so I think it was really not as much that he was um, on, out of touch with people. It was that public he, perception. It was public yes, perception. Yes, it was the public and, yeah, perception. It was, sort exactly. of was expected yeah. of people in terms of, of outreach. Well, we certainly yeah. will see faith on display today. Faith so important to both George H.W. and Barbara Bush. And we'll be hearing, I'm sure, a lot about that this morning from St. Martin's Episcopal Church. Let's go back to Lee Powell, who's standing right outside. Hi, Lee. Hi, Libby. Uh, once again, from St. Martin's Episcopal Church here in Houston, where it is starting to very lightly sprinkle. Uh, the weather has been good uh, all the uh, days leading up to uh, this event, but it is overcast today, and there's a little bit of, uh, of uh, rain perhaps moving in. I did want to tell you a little bit about the church behind me. It was uh, founded in 1952. In fact, it is the largest Episcopal church in uh, North America, about 9,000 members. Um, the church building behind me was actually completed in 2004, so it's a fairly new building, and it's based on a God Gothic church in Germany. Um, the campus here is about seven acres, and of course, the last uh, large public event here was back in April when Barbara Bush uh, was laid to rest. I do want to read you something from Russ, Reverend Russ Levinson, who you just saw a moment ago in front of the congregation, in front of the people gathered here for the service, giving them some instructions about the order of the day. This is what he said in his end note to the sermon, to his sermon here on uh, Sunday, uh, as news of uh, President George H.W. Bush's. Uh, passing, uh, you know, came out and 
the world started to learn. He basically said, this is what he said uh, about the service today. It will be an invitation only service and please don't have your feelings hurt if you are not invited. Everyone in the world feels as though they were best friends with the Bushes because of the way they lived their lives. So that kind of en encompasses, encapsulates the feeling we've heard all week here in Houston about people uh, really liking the Bushes. Uh, they were kind of uh, common fixtures all around town in big in events, big and small. Uh, and so this is one last way for uh, close family and friends, about 1,200 people expected here uh, to pay their respects uh, in the minutes ahead. Libby, back to you. Lee Powell, that's, that's so great. Uh, you know, if you were looking at images from inside St. Martin's a few moments ago, if you're a country fan, you recognize the Oak Ridge Boys. If you're not, you might have thought you saw Santa Claus <laughs> with the big white beard. But that's a member of the Oak Ridge Boys, and they do plan to perform today along with Reba McIntyre, who's inside uh, the church right now. Um, so we'll have, have a Texan flair. Um, George Bush uh, became really close to the Oak Ridge Boys. You and they were to. there for some big moments, including when he was on the campaign trail. Uh, um, so, so these are people who we not, you know, not just enjoyed the, the music of, but also cultivated relationships with. People sometimes accuse George H. W. Bush of sort of adopting Texas and country culture, but he loved it. He loved country music. Uh, this was not a this was not a facade. He used to talk about it all the time. And pork rinds. <laughs> yeah. Don't forget pork the pork rinds. <laughs> We will see a lot of the grandchildren of the Bushes uh, sharing readings today. We saw a little bit of that yesterday, but you'll see even more of that today. Um, Sally, when your late husband, Ben Bradley, died, you had a funeral service at National Cathedral, um, much like yesterday. Uh, I just want to point out there, you can see uh, the grandchildren continuing to come in. Um, we will hear a reading from Barbara Bush, Barbara Pierce Bush, the sister of Jenna Bush, who did a reading yesterday. Um, what's it like to be in these moments that are so private and personal and yet so incredibly public with, you know, in, in your case, thousands of people in attendance, um, thousands of people potentially watching, obviously, uh, this funeral today? You know, it was surreal. I mean, Ben died four years ago, and um, we had the service at National Cathedral. There were 3,000 people there, the vice president, the secretary of state, and it was surreal. It was absolutely surreal. And the thing was that, and, and I know they have, and the McCain family have, prepared for this. You knew, I mean, I knew several years before that this was going to happen. I knew that I was going to be walking down that aisle and that there were all these people and that my husband's casket was going to be right in front of me. But when you actually walk down there, you are, it's almost like you're in a bubble. Mm. It, it's not, because one minute, they were there, and the next minute they're not. They're dead. They're in front of you, in a, and and it's it's um, it's really um, it's it's really a strange feeling. And I, you know, I I didn't want to break down because I just didn't want to do that for Ben. And I was sort of, you know, digging my nails into my hands. And I was amazed. And my son did when he talked about my husband Ben. He did break down, and and George W. broke down yesterday. And you, you, to try to contain yourself and to and to make sure that you don't break down is really hard when you've got all of these people and mm -hmm. it's on television and you know everybody in in the world is watching mm -hmm. uh, and you're on display it's uh, it's it's a uh, it's a difficult it's a difficult moment and bill so many days of mourning uh, president trump by executive order declared yesterday a national day of mourning but uh, these proceedings have been going on for days we saw George H.W. Bush brought to Washington for one final time aboard uh, the president's plane, typically Air Force One, uh, also now brought back to Texas. So the Bush family has been going through this very public experience for many days now. Exactly. Ever since the de his death was announced mm -hmm. late Friday evening, early Saturday morning, uh, not only has his family been uh, going through it, but the nation has had to pause and reflect. Yes, okay, this was the president. Oh, yeah, I remember George W. H. W. Bush. Oh, yes. And people will cast back to that time and what they were going through when he was president. And they'll remember things that he did. So it becomes a sort of collective, mm -hmm. uh, which is part of the whole ritual of mourning. And you pointed out it's been 10 years since we've had a presidential state funeral, more than 10 years. Um, and so Ford this is something that's, that's fairly unique. You can see the family coming in. And we've talked about how. Uh, the Bushes had six children, five of them survive, and you can see their, um, their daughter, Doro Bush, and, and uh, Neil Bush, of course, there's Jeb Bush, 
and then the former first lady and former president George well, W. Bush. What was stunning was that even though he was doing badly and they knew that, they didn't realize that he was going to go so quickly. Mm. And um, they didn't know, um, in, in sort of four o'clock in the afternoon, there was a dinner Doro was supposed to go to and dropped out at like four o'clock in the afternoon on Friday because her father wasn't doing well and didn't make it down to Texas. And neither did George W. No, he was at home in uh, yeah. New Delhi. I mean, according to um, Peter Baker's story in the New York Times, I mean, he'd had, uh, Jim Baker had gone by there and seen mm -hmm. him, and he was having eggs and yogurt and everything that morning, and then he had this feeling on his way to dinner that night that maybe he should stop by, and by that time, the president was going downhill and just died very quickly yeah. so that the family wasn't able to get there in time to see him. James Baker uh, told the story to Dan Baltz, who recounted just what touching moments there were, those last hours where James Baker is rubbing the feet of his mm -hmm. close friend, the former president, and that phone call is made to George W. Bush. And of course, we heard them all talk about yesterday how those final words were, were words of love and affection for family, something that was so important. Uh, to George H.W. Bush. As the family now has come in, uh, the church has filled up. Why don't we go live and, and, and just watch some of the, uh, the scenes from inside St. Martin's, listen to the music as uh, we prepare for this final funeral of George H.W. Bush, the 41st president of the United States. On behalf of the family and St. Martin's Episcopal Church, I welcome you to this service and celebration of the life and faith of our 41st President, George Herbert Walker Bush. If you would, please turn in your bulletins to page six. Let us sing together with strength, O oh, beautiful for spacious skies.
seated. We have one anthem that we are going to play, and this was one of the anthems that was offered on the day of the 41st President's inauguration. This is my country. With faith in Jesus Christ, we receive the body of our brother George Herbert Walker Bush for burial. Let us pray with confidence to God, the giver of life, that he will raise him to the perfection in the company of the saints. Deliver your servant George, O sovereign Lord Christ, from all evil, and set him free from every bond that he may rest with all your saints in the eternal habitations where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign one God forever and ever. Amen. Let us also pray for all who mourn that they may cast their care on God and know the consolation of his love. Almighty God, look with pity upon the sorrows of your servants for whom we pray. Remember them, Lord, in mercy Nourish them with patience. Comfort them with a sense of your goodness. Lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Please stand. Life, saith the Lord, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though this body be destroyed, yet shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold and not as a stranger. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For if we live, we live unto the Lord. And if we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Even so saith the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. Let us now sing together our national anthem.
The Lord be with you. And Remaining standing, let us pray. O oh God, whose mercies cannot be numbered, accept our prayers on behalf of thy servant, George Herbert Walker Bush, and grant George an entrance into the land of light and joy and the fellowship of thy saints, the Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. A reading from Lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve the sons of men. The word of the Lord. Today's appointed psalm is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. My friends, we're here today in the house of the Lord to say goodbye to a man of great faith and great integrity, a truly beautiful human being, and to honor his noble character, his life of service, and the sweet memories he leaves for his friends, his family, and for our grateful nation. For more than 60 years, George Herbert Walker Bush has been my friend and he's been my role model. Today, as we entrust his soul to heaven, his name to history, and his memory to our hearts, I must begin with an apology. Heffy, I am about to do something you always hated and that your mother always told you not to do brag about yourself. I will do this because it must be done. And because, as a lawyer, I see that thing beloved by all lawyers, a loophole. <laughs> now, don't brag, don't brag about yourself, you once wrote. Let others point out your virtues, your good points. Well, today, Mr. President, I am that other with the special privilege and joy of sharing your good points. As we have heard and as we know, 
George Bush was a charter member of the greatest generation. As we gather here to salute him, his incredible service to our nation and the world are already etched in the marble of time. After becoming the youngest naval aviator, he served in increasingly responsible positions on behalf of his country, congressman, ambassador to China and to the United Nations, director of the CIA, and vice president. Then, as history will faithfully record, he became one of our nation's finest presidents and beyond any doubt, our nation's very best one-term president. For millions and millions across the globe, the world became a better place because George Bush occupied the White House for four years. He was not considered a skilled speaker, but his deeds were quite eloquent. And he demonstrated their eloquence by carving them into the hard granite of history. They expressed his moral character, and they reflected his decency, his boundless kindness and consideration of others, his determination always to do the right thing and always to do that to the very best of his ability. They testify to a life nobly lived. He possessed the classic virtues of our civilization and of his faith, the same virtues that express what is really best about this country. These same ideals were known to and they were shared by our founding fathers. George Bush was temperate in thought, in word, and in deed. He considered his choices and then he chose wisely. The Berlin Wall fell in November 1989, less than one year into his presidency. It was a remarkable triumph for American foreign policy. As joyous East and West Germans danced on the remains of that hated wall, George Bush could have joined them, metaphorically, and claimed victory for the West, for America, and frankly, for himself. But he did not. He knew better. He understood that humility toward and not humiliation of a fallen adversary was the very best path to peace and reconciliation. And so he was able to unify Germany as a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, notwithstanding the initial reservations of France, the United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union. Thus, the Cold War ended, not with a bang, but with the sound of a halyard rattling through a pulley over the Kremlin on a cold night in December 1991, as the flag of the Soviet Union was lowered for the very last time. Need we ask about George Bush's courage? During World War II, he risked his life in defense of something greater than himself. Decades later, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in August 1990 and began to brutalize Kuwaitis, George Bush never wavered. This will not stand, he said, and he got the rest of the world to join him in reversing that aggression. Yes, he had the courage of a warrior. But when the time came for prudence, he always maintained the greater courage of a peacemaker. He ended the wars in Central America. He signed two nuclear arms reduction treaties, and he brought Israel and all of its Arab neighbors together face to face for the first time to talk peace. His deeds for his fellow man always spoke for him. Give someone else a hand, he would say, and he did. When a friend is hurting, show that you care, he would say, and he did. Be kind to people, he would say, and he was. To the parents of a young son who lost, 
of, of a young son lost to cancer, he wrote, I hope you will live the rest of your lives with only happy memories of that wonderful son who is now safely tucked in God's loving arms around him. His wish for a kinder, gentler nation was not a cynical political slogan. It came honest and unguarded from his soul. After they left the White House, George and Barbara Bush continued to display their compassion for others. Their dedication to the points of light, the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy, and countless other charities is a model for all former First Families, past, present, and future. To these virtues, we can add one more source of his character, his family. As a friend once put it, George Bush believed that family is a source of both personal strength and the values one needs to face life. And of course, history has shown that few families have accomplished as much as his has. Barbara wrote the book on how to be a great first lady. His legacy lives on with his children who have contributed so very much to making our nation great. And who knows what the future will bring for his grandchildren and their children. I've always been proud that George Bush used to describe our relationship as one of big brother and little brother. He used to say that one of the things he liked best about me was that I would always tell him what I thought, even when I knew he didn't want to hear it. Then we would have a spirited discussion about that issue. But he had a very effective way of letting me know when the discussion was over. <laughs> he would look at me and he'd say, Baker, if you're so smart, why am I president and you're not? <laughs> he, would, he was a leader and he knew it. My hope is that in remembering the life of George Herbert Walker Bush and in honoring his accomplishments, we will see that we are really praising what is best about our nation, the nation he dearly loved and whose values he embodied. There is more to say than time permits. And anyway, when measured against the eloquence of George Bush's character and life, our words are very inadequate. And so I conclude these remarks with his words, written some years ago to his old tennis buddy. We have known each other a long time, he wrote to me. We have shared joy and sadness, and time has indeed gone swiftly by. Now it races on even faster, and that makes me treasure even more this line of William Butler Yeats about where man's glory begins and ends, namely with friends. My glory is I have you as such a friend. To which I reply on behalf of his friends here today, across America and throughout the world, we rejoice, Mr. President, that you are safely tucked in now and through the ages with God's loving arms around you. <laughs> Because our glory, George, was to have had you as our president and as such a friend. Good morning. Today I stand before you as the oldest grandson of the man I simply knew as Gampy. George Herbert Walker Bush was the most gracious, most decent, most humble man that I will ever know. We are here to give thanks for his extraordinary life, but I'd like to talk about some of the things 
that he was thankful for, the things that to him mattered most. My grandfather was thankful for his family. When he began running for president in 1988, my grandfather released a campaign book outlining his views for the future. The book opened with a letter to a grandson. It was addressed to me and recounted some of our recent experiences together in Maine. P, the letter read, I've been thinking about it a lot. The most fun was the big rock boat, climbing out on it, watching you and Noel playing on it. Near the end of summer when the moon was full, the tides were high, there was that special day when it almost seemed like the boat was real. In those few words, my grandfather said more about his life than I could ever tell you this morning. Here's a man gearing up for the role of a lifetime, and yet his mind went back to his family. This is a book about policy issues, and yet he still found time to write about an imaginary boat that he built with his grandson. In a typical day, he'd wake up around 5 a.m. to review security briefings and grab his first coffee of the day. When the coast was clear, all the grandkids would try our best to snag a spot on the bed and nestle up between him and Ganny while they read the paper. We all grew up in awe of my grandfather, a larger-than-life figure who we'd catch fly fishing off the rocks in Maine, talking up where the bluefish were running. He would be the first to host intense horseshoe matchups among family, secret service, or, or any willing head of state, while encouraging trash talk like power outage if your horseshoe was short, or Woodrow Wilson if you're long and your shoe hit the wooden backstop. His typical spread included barbecue, tacos, tamales, pork rinds with hot sauce, with a healthy complement of Bluebell ice cream and Klondike bars. Always the competitor, each night, Gampy challenged all of the grandkids to the coveted First to Sleep Award. <laughs> In classic Gampy fashion, he'd write letters of encouragement to us all, whether one of us had a hard semester at school, whether one of us, and for the record, not me, drove his fidelity onto the rocks, <laughs> or one of us, definitely not me, ended up in Ganny's crosshairs. I knew too much. Uh, at the close of one summer after he left public service, Gampy wrote an email to us all saying, the only thing wrong with the last five months is that none of you were here enough. Next year, promise this old Gampster that you will spend more time with us here by the sea. As you know, I've had to give up fly fishing off the rocks in Maine, but there are plenty of wonderful things to do. I think of you all an awful lot. I just wonder how each of you is doing in school and in life. If you need me, I'm here for you because I love you very much. In the Psalms, God makes his promise. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Today, we know that my Gampy did enjoy a long and extraordinary life, and we know he's enjoying the beginning of his next life rejoining those whom he lost but now, by grace, has found again. My grandfather was thankful for his country. He was grateful to lead a country where people can go as far and as fast as their dreams can take them, a place where individuals working alone or in groups can help the condition of their fellow man on a voluntary basis, a bright hope for America he evoked so brilliantly when he spoke of a thousand points of light. He often spoke about the timeless creed of duty, honor, country, the values that have sustained the republic for its over 240 years. But this wasn't something he just talked about. This is something he lived. Having flown 58 combat missions in the Pacific and having been shot down and rescued at sea, he never saw his own heroism as being any greater than anyone else that has worn the uniform. I know this because I've experienced it personally. He was proud when Walker joined the Marine Corps, when I joined the Navy, and even prouder when we served overseas. Our service never compared to his, yet we could never convince him of that. In our times together, our big, wonderful, and competitive family saw the personal goodness that led to his recognized historical greatness. He left a simple yet profound legacy to his children, to his grandchildren, and to this country. Service. Undoubtedly, when the last words are written in, on him, they will certainly include this, that the fulfillment of a complete life cannot be achieved without service to others. You should know that my grandfather was thankful for his God. He once told us as the grandkids, God is good, but his love has a cost. We must be good to one another. It was his faith 
his love for others that fulfilled him, that drove him, that led him to a life of public service. Here in Houston at a prayer breakfast, he once reflected on his time on the deck of the submarine Finback, which rescued him after he was shot down during World War II. To get some fresh air, he went on the deck, stood the watch, looked out in the dark. He said the sky was clear, the stars were brilliant, like a blizzard of fireflies in the night. There was a calm inner peace. Halfway around the world, in a war zone, a calm inner peace. God's therapy. Today, after 94 years, the heavy hand of time has claimed the life of my Gamps. But in death as in life, my grandfather has won, for he has exchanged his earthly burdens for a heavenly home and is at peace. Yes, George Herbert Walker Bush is the most gracious, most decent, most humble man that I will ever know, and it's the honor of a lifetime to share his name. God bless you, Gampy. Until we meet again, maybe out on that rock boat we built together. the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. And I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all of my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I become an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And And the greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. A favorite hymn of the President's, Eternal Father, strong to save. I invite you to turn to page seven. We'll sing the first two verses before the gospel, the last two after the gospel.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. The Gospel of the Lord. To bow your head for prayer. Almighty God, the source of all life, may our eyes and our hearts this day give thanks for this remarkable life. May our eyes and our hearts turn to you, as did the heart of this great man. In Christ's name I pray, amen. A few days before Barbara Bush's death, I was called to the Bush home, and the president asked me to pray with her. I went and knocked on her door, and Barbara answered, Hello, Russ. I'm not checking out yet. <clears throat> we talked for a bit. I asked permission to anoint her head with oil and pray with her, and we did. We prayed. I left, and then she called me to come back in. Bar, are you okay? I said. She said, yes. Just tell him I adore him. Today we are gathered to celebrate the life of a man that we all adored. At the beginning of a journey that began June 12, 1924, George Herbert Walker Bush was born into the cradle of a loving family that held fast to the values of friendship and family and faith, of integrity, honesty, and loyalty, of character, courage, and service. 
Now at the end of that journey, that cradle that sustained him throughout his 94 years of life has released him into the loving arms of his heavenly Father. The end depends on the beginning, and this is a good ending because from the very beginning, George Bush was committed to a life not for himself, but for others. And so we gather today charged with three tasks, saying goodbye, giving our thanks, and lifting up our lives to hope. Bidding farewell is the hardest of these tasks because we must acknowledge that the world is, is not the same without this great man. The tectonic plates of our world have shifted. In today's world, we sometimes recoil at the complex emotions instead of shedding tears of grief that honor our loved ones. Tears honor those we love. George Bush was never afraid to shed tears, and so today I bid you to follow his example. We also gather to give thanks for the actions of this incredible public servant who improved the lives of so many around the world, across the nation, and in our great state of Texas and our beloved city of Houston. Each of us gathered here today join untold millions around the globe to mourn the death of one of history's greatest leaders. But we have lost more than a leader. He, like his wife of over 70 years, Barbara, had that unique ability to make you feel like he was your best friend and, and you were his. And he pulled it off with charm and humility and humor with few, if any, rivals. So however you do it today, whether through quiet meditation or tearful remembrance or jubilant story, give thanks that his life brushed up against yours. Goodbye. Thank you. But there is one more thing we come to do, and that is to lift up our lives to hope. What do I mean by that? Well, President Bush was a man of faith, a faith that sustained him in this life and now has brought him new life. The President and Barbara Bush were devoted and active members of this church, St. Martin's, for over 50 years. In a talk the President gave here in 1982, he spoke of his love for St. Martin's, his memories of teaching Sunday school and serving coffee and worshiping here. This is what he said, I remember sitting in the back and how my pew wiggled and shook as our four boys and sometimes Dora got the giggles. And then he added, I don't want to hold it over the rest of you. But how many of you can say of the Christmas pageant, my grandson was a shepherd in 1980 and his sister an angel, both in the same year? As he was giving this talk, Barbara spoke up and said, did it ever occur to you that they both made it because you had just been elected vice president? <laughs> But there was a deeper purpose in his faith. In an open letter to clergy across the United States just before his elect inauguration, the president-elect Bush wrote, worship is basic to my own life. Our family has endeavored to uphold our faith by participation in the life of our church. In an address two years into his presidency, he recalled President Lincoln's response at the height of the Civil War when asked if he thought the Lord was on Lincoln's side. And Lincoln responded, my concern is not whether God is on our side, but whether we are on God's side. Make no mistake about it, George Bush was on God's side. It's why, together, we carefully chose the lessons for this service, which I hope you'll take home and read and reflect upon there, are lessons that bespeak of the love of God and the comfort of God and the hope of life eternal given to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Martin of Tours is the patron saint of this parish. And he's best known for tearing his cloak in two to cover a barely dressed beggar he did so impulsively, instinctively, knowing that it was the right thing to do. Only later was it revealed to him in a dream that his selfless act had clothed Christ himself. 
Now, those of us fortunate to worship with Georgia and Barbara Bush here witnessed a similar selflessness. As we worshiped together, they never made a show or a fuss of arriving, worshiping, or leaving. They loved to spend time with the members here. They had a favorite spot right over there, but if they arrived and someone had beat them to it, they never created a problem. In fact, particularly crowded days, Christmas and Easter, they often relinquished their seats to mother overloaded with children or a son coming with his elderly parents. One particularly cold day, as the president came in the back, he was met by an usher who didn't have on an overcoat. Aren't you cold? The president asked. And the young man said, oh, I'm fine. But before he could finish his sentence, the president whipped off his own coat and placed it around the gent's shoulders. And he walked into worship with a smile and without another word. George Bush loved our Lord and knew our Lord loved him. And it was that connection that birthed in the 41st president a desire to serve. A few years ago, the president and I discussed his deteriorating health. At the time, he didn't know how that struggle would end. And he put a question to me about as simply as anybody could. He said, well, what do you think heaven's like? It was a confident statement one that bespoke of a resolute faith. He didn't want to know if there was a heaven or whether he would be there when the end came. He said he just wanted to know what it was like. He was ready for heaven, and heaven was ready for him. My guess is that on December 30th, when the president arrived in heaven, that Barbara was standing there with her hands on her hips saying, what took you so long? <laughs> but then a big old Texas-sized hug from his wife and daughter with the words, we adore you. His very first act, after being sworn into office as the 41st president, was to lead our nation in prayer. And as the end depends on the beginning, and as we say our goodbyes, I want to invite you to pray in honor and thanksgiving in celebration of this man that we know and love, this man we adore. Would you bow your heads? May his prayer, this was his prayer on the day of his inauguration, his first act as president. Heavenly Father, we bow our heads and thank you for your love. Accept our thanks for the peace that yields this day and the shared faith that makes its continuance likely. Make us strong to do your work, willing to heed and hear your will, and write on our hearts these words. Use power to help people. For we are given power not to advance our own purposes, nor to make a great show in the world, nor name. There is but one just use of power, and it is to serve people. Help us remember, Lord. Amen. Here, sir. We told you we would be. And it's an honor. We first sang for him in October of 1983 on the lawn of the White House when he was vice president. And he said, fellas, he always called us fellas, would you sing me a few songs? I'm a big fan. For decades, we have sang for him. 
and this is, a, again, a real honor to be here. What a lot of people may not know is he fancied himself to be a good bass singer. He was not. <laughs> we'll sing for our president. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. In the Episcopal Church, which is the President's tradition, uh, we stand to say things we believe. So in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection of life eternal, may I invite you to please turn to page four. And together, let us recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended in heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Our Father, Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy, oh, thy name. Thy Forgive us 
Please stand for the prayers of the people. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Almighty God, who has knit together thine elect in one communion and fellowship, in the mystical body of thy Son, Christ our Lord, grant, we beseech thee, to thy whole church in paradise and on earth, thy light and thy peace. Amen. Amen. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to newness of life, and that through the grave and gate of death we may pass with him to our joyful resurrection. Amen. Amen. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith that thy Holy Spirit may lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days. Amen. Amen. Grant to thy faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve thee with a quiet mind. Amen. Grant to all who mourn a sure confidence in thy fatherly care, that casting all their grief on thee, they may know the consolation of thy love. Amen. Amen. Give courage and faith to those who are bereaved, that they may have strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a reasonable and holy hope, in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. Amen. Help us, we pray, in the midst of things we cannot understand, to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Grant that increasing in knowledge and love of thee, George may go from strength to strength in the life of perfect service in thy heavenly kingdom. Amen. Amen. Grant us, with all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, to have our consummation and bliss in thy eternal and everlasting glory, and with all thy saints to receive the crown of life, which thou dost promise to all who share in the victory of thy Son, Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God for ever and ever. Amen. Please sit for the anthem.
Please stand for the commendation in the middle of page five. Give rest, O Christ, to thy servant with thy saints. Where sorrow and pain are no more, not a sign, but life everlasting. Thou only art immortal, the creator and maker of mankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and unto earth shall we return. For so thou didst ordain when thou createdst me, saying, Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. All we go down to the dust, yet even at the grave, we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The rest, the rest is Christ, Christ thy servant with thy saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, a sign but life everlasting. Into thy hands, O merciful Savior, we commend thy servant, George. Acknowledge we humbly beseech thee, a sheep of thine own fold, a lamb of thine own flock, a sinner of thine own redeeming. Receive George into the arms of thy mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Amen. Before our bishop, the bishop of the great diocese of Texas offers a blessing. Let me share with you that when we Leave today, we'll be singing hymn number 562, Onward Christian Soldiers. It's on page eight and nine of your booklet. It was one of the favorites of the 41st president. And as we leave the church, we would ask that everyone please remain in your seats unless you were instructed to do so. Otherwise, please remain in your seats until the family, pallbearers, leave the church, and then until uh, we drive away for the president's burial. We'll ask that you Please remain here and continue in a spirit of prayer and thanksgiving for this remarkable man's life and the celebration of his life now with our Lord. Unto God's gracious mercy and protection, we commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. And this concludes the funeral service for former President George Herbert Walker Bush at St. Martin's Episcopal Church in Houston, Texas, where he was a congregant for 50 years. You're watching live coverage from the Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey, and I'm joined here in our studio by Bill Plant and Sally Quinn. Sally, what stood out to you from this funeral service this morning? Uh, I think the word service, service, service. Uh, it, it, we saw that yesterday at the National Cathedral, and we saw it today. That. And he, even in his prayer at the inauguration, he talked about what it meant to serve people, the decency, the courage, the honesty, the friendship. Uh, I loved it when Baker said, don't brag about yourself, let other people talk about your virtues. I mean, it, it, clearly, he was a, a wonderful man. And, and, you know, he was, it was a horrible loss for him when he lost the presidency, when he lost that election. I remember one night he invited my husband and me, Ben Bradley and Barry Goldwater, to come to the White House for drinks. And it was right after the election. And my husband had just stepped down as editor of the Washington Post. And I knew he wanted to talk to me, got me aside. And he said, let me just give you a little tour. And we went into the Lincoln bedroom and he was talking about how he spent time there during the Kuwait war. And I, I, could, I could tell he wanted to talk to me about something. We got out in the hall and he said, what's it like? And I said, what do you mean, what's it like? And he said, what is it like to lose a job and to 
to be somebody like Ben was for 30 years, being editor of the Washington Post and then not having that job and not being that person because I'm going to be that person. What is it like? How has Ben dealing with it? What is, and, and I said, you know, you and Ben are very much alike, and they are. They had a, a history that's similar. But I said, you know, Ben is very much his own person, and he's the same person, and you're going to be the same person too. And he was. I mean, after that, he never stopped serving, serving, serving. He never stopped being decent. He never stopped being kind. He never stopped being a good friend. And I think that, uh, and I think once he got over that initial response of, I've lost, what am I going to do with myself? It was full bore. And I remember when he jumped out of the parachute at age 90, <laughs> Ben wrote him a, a, a fan letter and said, you, you are my hero for life. <laughs> In this passing of the former president, a lot of us are learning more about the man he was, not just the leader that he was, the decisions that he made that impacted not just Americans, but people around the globe, but, but the human being. And we're getting more insight into the person that you got to know, Sally, and seeing that side of him that was so judicious and self-effacing, um, at the same time confident, competitive, and we see the legacy that he leaves with his family. As we heard his grandson talk today about that life of service and what it meant uh, to be a family member of someone who dedicated himself to service, Bill, what stood out to you? Today was definitely about family. It was in contrast somewhat to yesterday's very formal service here in Washington. But when you heard his grandson talking about how he was with the grandchildren mm -hmm. and how he played with them, how he spent time with them, but how he at the same time tried to pass on to them his legacy of service and his ideals. And when Sally was talking about how he took uh, defeat, it reminded me of something Baker said about how Bush was always temperate in thought, word, and deed. Mm. And he, re he remained temperate after he lost. The Bush's example of his temperance, of course, was uh, at the fall of the Berlin Wall when he didn't uh, dance on top of the wall didn't claim a victory, but instead was humble enough to allow peace and reconciliation to take place in Europe and with Russia. Something else that James Baker talked about was that his longtime friend, the former president, had the courage of a warrior, but greater courage of a peacemaker, which is not something that we necessarily uh, talk about and, and openly admire as much, I feel like, right now in, in this moment in history. I think uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's very accurate because to be a peacemaker means to pull back from your warlike instincts. And that is not what is necessarily admired in our culture, mm -hmm. but it was part of the way he was brought up. Well, I think, again, as with yesterday at the funeral in the cathedral, one couldn't help but make the the comparison between George Bush and Donald Trump. And, you know, it is much harder to make peace than it is to make war. As Donald Trump said to the Korean leader, my button is bigger than your button. Uh, and, you know, and so uh, for him, the idea of making war is just pushing a button. Uh, and, and there seems to be uh, a lot less emphasis on diplomacy and peacemaking, and that's what George Bush was very good at. I think it's, it's worth pointing out here that people who have been in war, like George Herbert Walker Bush, or like Senator Bob Dole, who was there yesterday, understand how awful war is. People who've never served or who've never been in war sometimes have a glamorous picture of marching toward victory. It's ugly. It's terrible. I've seen it firsthand. Well, you know, my father was uh, a, a, in the Army, he was a general in the Army and fought in two wars, and my husband fought in World War II. So I, I have come, as an Army brat, come away with the idea that, that war is not glamorous. It's, it's horrible. And I think there is, it's, it's important, and it has been important to have a president who has been at war to understand what the impact and the, and the consequences are of getting into a war. Sally and Bill, as you both watched the Bush administration and uh, his time leading up to that as vice president, was there, was there an appreciation and, and a real discussion here in Washington about the traits of prudence, temperance, trying to build coalitions, going you know, behind the scenes, making those phone calls to other world leaders? Is that something that, that, that the American culture at large appreciated? Is it different than what the Washington press corps perhaps saw and appreciated? 
I think he was appreciated for what he was able to do, for instance, in gathering the coalition to respond to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. Uh, I think that was universally applauded. But the flip side of that was that there was a tendency, particularly among our brethren in the press, to view him as kind of wimpy sometimes. I, you know, and the thing was, uh, uh, Evan Thomas, who wrote the Newsweek cover, uh, uh, was so apologetic um, recently about saying, you know, that was that was the worst mistake that we made. That he wasn't a wimp. That he was just somebody who was prudent. Uh, but I, I, I think that he was so well respected, even if you didn't agree with him politically in Washington. And I think that, you know, his his whole way of dealing with people was to reach out. And I think that that has stopped. Um, and even during the Obama administration, you know, the Obama administration, they were more closed in. They didn't reach out as much as other presidents had. And I think now it's even worse that there's no reaching out at all in Washington uh, by anybody from this administration and, and, and vice versa. Sally Quinn, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Bill Plant is going to stick around. Let's head down to College Station, Texas, where Nicole Ellis is standing by. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Libby. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm outside of the uh, Presidential Library and Museum for George H.W. Bush. Uh, even just thinking about everything that uh, George P. Bush was saying, something that really stuck out as a Texan and, and someone who, who definitely can relate, uh, he mentioned tamales, barbecue, and bluebell were President Bush's favorite things. And if you're another Texan like myself, you know, it, it immediately clicked. Um, but there's so much significance to his time, both in Texas and, uh, and particularly his relationship relationship to A&M. Uh, it's worth mentioning that not only is his uh, museum and library here, but also the um, the, Bush, pre the uh, Bush School of Government and Public Service. And he actually played a huge role in bringing a lot of world leaders in, to, to A&M and elevating not only the Bush School, but also the entire university. Uh, a few names to list off uh, are, you know, he brought in former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, former, former British Prime Minister uh, Margaret Thatcher, and former, former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev all here to A&M. Um, it's truly a remarkable time to be sort of outside of, of where his final resting place will be with his uh, with his daughter, Robin, and wife, Barbara. Uh, another thing to mention, I'd say, is, is in 2016, not rather, not 2016, uh, la just last year after Hurricane Harvey, he canceled a black tie gala and convinced the uh, four other former presidents at the time to come and join him here in at A and M and and just listen and pay attention to people here at A and M. Uh, so he has a, a strong relationship with the university and he's done a, an incredible sort of part of of not letting his words but his actions speak for his dedication to Texas and to A and M. Um, we look forward to just you know continuing to learn more about that legacy and share more about it here at, at A and M and and walk you through the final proceedings and his. His time here as his, at, at his final resting place. Uh, Libby, we will continue to keep you updated, and I'm going to toss it back to you. Thank you so much. So Nicole Ellis is, is at the Presidential Library, will, which will be the final resting place of George Herbert Walker Bush. And we'll see this journey today. The journey continues for one more step, gentlemen, as we go from Houston, Texas, where you can see the exterior of St. Martin's right now, uh, and the casket will go by train to Texas A&M.
The children of George Herbert Walker Bush and Barbara Bush walking away there. You see their five surviving children and their spouses. They'll be leaving St. Martin's Episcopal Church and heading next to Texas A&M and the Presidential Library, which is where the former president, the 41st president of the United States, will be buried. A good part of that journey will be made by train, and we'll be watching that. We'll continue to bring you these live images. as the hearse heads to the train station and then the departure point, ultimately arriving at Texas A&M. I'm Libby Casey, and you're watching live coverage from the Washington Post. I'm joined here on set by uh, Bill Plant, uh, who has been such a longtime watcher of Washington, someone who covered uh, the administrations, the time in office of uh, the former president, former vice president, also his time, even when he was uh, doing other things here, like director of the CIA. We also have on set with us Eugene Scott, writer for The Fix, who covers entity politics. Great to have you here, Eugene. Thank you. And um, we also have Bill Hendricks, uh, who has been writing some really poignant pieces as a feature writer here for The Post about the Bush family, excuse me, Steve Hendricks, the Bush family, I know, I just saw that there, uh, the, about the Bush family and the relationship in particular of George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush. Right. As you watch President George W. Bush, former president, go through this emotional ceremony, emotional funeral today, what's been standing out in your mind? Well, there's been so much speculation over the years of what the relationship between the president father and the president's son must have been. Uh, an assumption that it must have had a lot of Oedipal family drama connected to it, a lot of rivalry. Um, I think the last few days have really shown people how much it was just a boy and his dad in some ways. I mean, the really pure and painful grief that we saw uh, throughout the week, starting with Monday night when George W. Bush first came to the Capitol and stood before the casket. I don't think anyone could have looked at his face and, and seen much beyond um, just the real deep pain of loss. And of course, the eulogy yesterday was so moving, especially at the end when he said, you couldn't have been a better father. Um, so, you know, I don't think that um, there will always be speculation about the, the super achieving father son combination here, but I think it's easier for, for me at least to understand that at the heart of all that was a very loving relationship. Mm -hmm. And we heard today uh, one of the grandchildren, uh, George Prescott Bush, who bears this legacy name. He's the son of Jeb Bush, and talking about his grandfather. Um, and he really was giving, as you said, Bill, this personal perspective of what it was like to, to be with Gampy, as the kids called him, um, to see him as, as a human being and a grandfather first. But he also, uh, in, in addition to that, talked about how his grandfather passed on to the grandkids this whole idea of service to the country, uh, speaking to them uh, always of duty, honor, and country, not apparently in a didactic way, but in a way of uh, suggesting that this is what they owed the country and what they were should be brought up to understand. 
Eugene, you've been watching this all unfold over the last few days. What stood out to you from this morning? Well, a continuation of the points you all were just discussing. As you mentioned before, I write about identity, and one of the topics I'm most fascinated by in covering politics is that uh, these individuals have identities beyond their jobs. They're also fathers and brothers and grandfathers and uncles and sons, and we don't often get to see that uh, except for these family gatherings, which a funeral actually is. It's very much a state affair, but we have to trust that their uh, relatives coming together who haven't seen each other in a while, and we saw uh, Jeb and George W. Uh, joking with the handkerchief a bit after the eulogy, and it's just always fascinating to see uh, that in addition to being world leaders, these, these are people who have a very similar uh, challenges and, and joys and emotions as we do, citizens and voters, because at the end of the day, they're a family as well as public servants. We don't really see them as human beings, we often, don't. do we? We don't. We don't. But, I mean, I, I, I really enjoyed uh, watching the granddaughters. I mean, I think most of us have fond memories of our grandparents. And so being able to see um, them express who he was uh, as a parent of their parents, I think was fascinating and perhaps gave us an insight into uh, this president that we didn't have uh, before. And seeing Barbara Bush and, and Jenna Bush Hag Haggerty, uh, Hager, excuse me, on uh, you know, as part of this public mourning process, some kids who we saw really grow up and turn in, go from teenagers mm -hmm. to grown-ups, as their father was serving in the White House, hear this connection they had to their grandfather that was mm -hmm. so strong and so loving. Um, you know, it's part of the job of journalists to, to, to look past the personal, though, and, and see the political ramifications right. and to see the legacy. So while it's part of our job to see them as human beings mm -hmm. and recognize um, you know, the challenges they face, see them uh, as full mm -hmm. people, we also have to look at their policies without getting overly, uh, overly sentimental and overly pulled into yeah. uh, any sort of personal relationship. So what's been standing up out to you, Eugene, about mm -hmm the president's record and his service to the nation. I think that's a very important point, and I've been involved in many conversations in the last few days. When is it the appropriate time to talk about the implications of policy mm -hmm. when a policymaker passes? Mm. Some people will say immediately. Some people would say when the body's in the ground. Some people would say never. But it often depends on where you stand on the receiving end of those policies. I've been reading quite a bit of work from people who survived the AIDS epidemic or new people who were involved in the AIDS epidemic, and consensus is that the president responded later than they would have liked to have seen him uh, respond in uh, addressing what ended up at the time uh, costing thousands, tens of thousands of lives that perhaps could have been prevented uh, had there been more funds uh, directed towards finding research related to AIDS um, and not taking such a moralistic approach uh, to uh, this illness, which at that point was largely viewed by many social conservatives that supported the president as a disease that immoral people uh, uh, received because of their sexual ethics. Um, and so there's been quite a bit of look back at that. He eventually responded, generally people would conclude, better than uh, Reagan responded to LGBT Americans um, in the AIDS epidemic. And that is in part because by the time he entered the White House, we saw that it wasn't something that was just unique to LGBT Americans, but people who um, had tr blood transfusions at the time. And we saw, we knew, remember Magic Johnson was on his uh, commission for mm -hmm. um, HIV. And so it, it went beyond sexual uh, LGBT sexual mm -hmm. ethics for people, um, and so there was there's some concern about that. Where would we be overall in the uh, fight to find a cure to AIDS had he acted more quickly? Mm. Obviously, we're also looking at racial uh, ethics. Uh, the president, George H. W. Bush had an interesting legacy. He really wanted to be on the forefront of improving the Republican Party's relationship with people of color. Um, when he went in college, he was a fundraiser for the United uh, Negro College Fund. Uh, when he moved to Texas, he met regularly with the head of the NAACP. But he also was aware of this block within the Republican Party um, of, of voters who struggled with the cultural anxieties of a changing America, mm. even 30 years ago, that we're talking about so regularly and often now in this Trump political climate. And testament of that is him launching his presidential campaign in Mississippi, um, being aware of what he was hoping to communicate. And obviously, we can go on and on. Willie Horton, which I think people have read about mm. repeatedly, 
city um, and the role he directly and indirectly uh, played in uh, perpetuating these ideas of black men being uh, criminals during this time where uh, the uh, mass incarceration complex just really got off the ground. Um, and so it's, uh, it's been really fascinating watching people say, can we talk about this now, um, when the reality is there are Americans whose lives were deeply affected and continue to be by policy, which is what happens with policymaking. And we'll continue to talk about that complex legacy. I want to take a moment and go to Lee Powell, who's right outside of St. Martin's. Lee, I'd love to hear from you about what you've been experiencing and witnessing um, in, in this front row seat you've had to history. Well, Libby, uh, hello from Houston, where we literally almost did have a front row seat. We're up on a riser uh, that is not far at all from um, where the casket came out into the hearse, now on the way to College Station. And uh, just a few minutes ago, it did uh, stream right by us, um, going on the way uh, north uh, to College Station. And one thing you uh, may not have seen, but uh, as the hearse passed by our position, over on that side, uh, there was a whole line of uh, Houston police officers, uh, Texas uh, state rangers, state troopers. They are all standing at attention and saluting uh, the procession as it went by. So it was a, a somber moment. Uh, we were asked to, to stay silent as the uh, casket came out of the church into the um, hearse for that, uh, those few moments. Um, it's a gray day here, kind of matching the mood, overcast, uh, off and off very light rain, temperature in the 60s, uh, and it's a fall day here. So fall kind of is coming late to Texas, and so this day kind of matched uh, the mood of the moment. Now, where that procession is heading next, they're back on the Houston highways, uh, not long uh, to, to Spring, Texas, which is a suburb uh, north of, of Houston, where they will go into a rail yard, uh, and the, the uh, casket will be put on a Union Pacific train that will then head to College Station. Now, the uh, route is about 70 miles. Um, and it's going to take about two and a half, three hours. The train is not going to go at full speed, probably about 30 miles an hour. So uh, the thousands that are expected along the uh, tracks can get a good look uh, as the train goes by. The, the uh, uh, casket will be in what they call kind of a, uh, an observation or display car, where there'll be some translucent uh, paneling or some windows on the side. So people, in fact, should get a, a glimpse at that uh, flag-covered uh, casket as, as the train rolls by, and then we'll end up in College Station where it will be unloaded and taken close to the uh, Bush uh, Library. Um, the train, of course, is being led by Locomotive 4141. Uh, it was delivered in 2005 and then painted in a display that's similar to Air Force One, the same kind of red, uh, gray, and gold colors. The number, of course, after President George H.W. Uh, Bush, the 41st president. Um, the Union Pacific Railroad, I talked to them yesterday, they tell me that that locomotive uh, has been put into service for, for freight service from time to time, but it's really been kind of kept in storage and under wraps, if you will, uh, in those years uh, since delivery, um, mainly because of some economic downturn in, in some of their business, um, but more just to sort of preserve it and to preserve the uh, very ornate uh, paint job on the locomotive. So it's been stored in North Little Rock, Arkansas for, 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 for some time and is now being pressed uh, back into service. Um, one last detail I will leave you with. Uh, the Bush family, uh, President, uh, particularly President George H.W. Bush, had a lifelong fascination with trains, um, partly because of the family's travels that took them so many places over the years, much of it by train travel. But there's an interesting uh, connection here. Um, the father of uh, George H.W. Bush, Prescott Bush, was in fact a business partner in banking in the 1930s with a gentleman named Avril Harriman. Now, his father was E.H. Harriman, who in fact uh, was a famous railroad executive in the early 1900s and in fact led the Union Pacific, was its president uh, for some time in the early 1900s, kind of a legendary figure in railroad circles. So there's even that connection going back many, many years uh, between the Bushes, uh, this train, and the Union Pacific line where it will soon travel. So Libby, back to you. Lee Powell, thank you so much. Uh, so much history there. And you see the 4141 right there on that train. Uh, you, Eugene was talking about some of the complexities of any president's time in office, mm -hmm. the legacy that they leave. Bill, I'd love to hear your sense as we spend this week reflecting on the political legacy and what was left behind by President George H.W. Bush. Um, how are you pairing 
George Bush the man with George Bush the national leader? Well, look, uh, Baker uh, said, okay, this was the greatest one-term president ever. He did have a pretty good record as president in one term on the policy issues, no question about it, particularly internationally. Uh, as we've discussed before, he was able to keep a lid on the breakup of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin War and not allow uh, chaos to erupt in Europe and with the Soviets and with the Russians after, after that. So that's quite an accomplishment in and of itself. Um, and for a one-term president, he accomplished quite a lot. But this week has been really all about uh, hearing what a good man he was. And while I have no doubt that that's true, it also ignores the rest of the policy implications. So someone like his biographer, who spoke first at yesterday's uh, funeral service, uh, is someone who might uh, well be uh, asked to fill in the blanks of the, where he was in a policy way. Steve, so many of the stories that you've been collecting and reporting on are those personal stories. And you co-wrote really an incredibly touching piece about the loss of the daughter, Robin Bush, and, mm. and what that meant for George and Barbara Bush. And it gave such a sense of humanity. It's something that I think anyone could relate to. Uh, what was it like to, to learn about this part of their story and how it impacted them as future parents as well as uh, future leaders in charitable efforts and, mm. and in their role in the White House? Well, I don't think any parent can, can learn that uh, a couple has lost a child and not know that that's a horrendous and life-changing <clears throat> event. But to, to go deeper into it and learn the details and how they responded afterwards was a bit of a, a surprise. And I think it, it does say something about the, the Bush uh, as the Bushes as a couple and as a family. Um, the, uh, Robin was only three when she was um, just complaining of fatigue and was taken to a doctor um, and within a few days a diagnosis came back of leukemia, which was actually a word that the Bushes had never heard before. This was a time when cancer was not well understood and, and almost taboo to talk about. And the the the, the suggestion from the doctor was just take her home, make her comfortable, and she will not live very long. Don't talk about it, don't bring it up, don't let her or your friends know. Uh, of course, they had the means uh, to do something more, and they immediately took her to New York, and she did receive treatment for many months, but she didn't survive. And the treatment itself was, was would, you know, by our measures, quite horrible. Um, uh, George H.W. couldn't be in the room during some of these procedures. Barbara never left her side. Um, so wrenching in all accounts. But when she did die, um, a, an event that often splits couples apart, both of them all through their lives talked about how it made them closer together. And I think uh, uh, George W. Bush has also talked about the fact that the family was brought closer together. Yeah, you recount that Barbara Bush marveled at, at people who experience tragedy and it tears families apart because she felt like she was really supported by her husband. Yeah, yeah. Um, Susan uh, Page, uh, who's writing a biography of Barbara Bush, uh, interviewed her uh, r relatively recently last year, I think, and, and went into the room to talk to her, and there above her chair was an oil portrait of, mm -hmm. of her daughter. So the child has never been far from the family. And of course, yesterday at his eulogy, George W. Bush said, we now can take comfort in the fact that that dad is is hugging Robin again and, and holding mom's hand. So it, it is, I think, a uniquely or an unusually close political family. I, I think about the Bushes and their genuine affection for each other in a little bit of a different way than I do about the Kennedys, say, or the Clintons or other um, uh, political dynastic families. Mm. You mentioned John Meacham, the biographer. Let's go back and listen to an excerpt from what John Meacham said yesterday in his eulogy for the man he wrote about, but also the man he befriended, the late President Bush. George Herbert Walker Bush was America's last great soldier statesman, a 20th century founding father. He governed with virtues that most closely resemble those of Washington and of Adams, of TR and of FDR, of Truman and of Eisenhower, of men who believed in causes larger than themselves. 
Six foot two, handsome, dominant in person, President Bush spoke with those big, strong hands, making fists to underscore points. A master of what Franklin Roosevelt called the science of human relationships, he believed that to whom much was given, much is expected. And because life gave him so much, he gave back again and again and again. He stood in the breach in the Cold War against totalitarianism. He stood in the breach in Washington against unthinking partisanship. He stood in the breach against tyranny and discrimination. And on his watch, a wall fell in Berlin. A dictator's aggression did not stand. And doors across America opened to those with disabilities. And in his personal life, he stood in the breach against heartbreak and hurt, always offering an outstretched hand, a warm word, a sympathetic tear. If you were down, he would rush to lift you up. And if you were soaring, he would rush to savor your success. Strong and gracious, comforting and charming, loving and loyal, he was our shield in danger's hour. We did learn that John Meacham shared this uh, speech that he had prepared, this eulogy that he had prepared with George H.W. Bush, uh, who was a bit nonplussed that it was so much about him, mm -hmm. Bill. He was taught from his earliest childhood not to speak of himself. Uh, he got that straight from his mother. And, you know, Baker referred to that today, James Baker, in his, in his eulogy. Uh, he was told uh, never to brag on himself. So Baker said that as a lawyer, he'd found a loophole and that he would do the bragging on him, and he proceeded to do that. But we talked earlier about the difference between uh, remembering him in, during this funeral period and how history will remember mm -hmm. him. It brings up the whole question of how we square the messy nature of our normal human interactions, uh, who we actually are, with who our national story says <laughs> we are supposed to be. It never matches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the reasons I, I think it uh, perhaps never uh, matches is because you reflect on the media's role in communicating who politicians are to the people that they serve. And I've seen quite a bit of uh, reflection, perhaps, uh, from the media about perhaps maybe how unfair they have been uh, to Bush in the past in terms of presenting him as this out-of-touch person because he comes from this WASP background and this wealth that made it difficult for some uh, Americans to uh, connect with in a way that perhaps gave Bill Clinton an advantage, being this person not from means from Arkansas uh, from a lower middle class background um, that really did not do a fair job of really communicating who Bush was despite the wealth despite the privilege despite the background public service really was a core value uh, that was communicated to the family um, and that he clearly has passed down to generations that have come after him even to the granddaughters I mean Jenna's a, I believe a journalist and, and Barbara worked in education um, and these are uh, of careers that they've chosen in part because of the values that their grandfather uh, passed down to them that he inherited himself. Mm -hmm. Let's head to Texas A&M where Nicole Ellis is standing by. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Libby. Uh, yes, again, I am right outside of uh, President Bush's library and museum, and I couldn't help but take note of Reverend Levison's comment that uh, as, Bar as he greets Barbara Bush in heaven, that she'll have her hand on her hip saying, what took you so long? Uh, I chatted with their longtime friend, Harris County Judge Ed Emmett, who, uh, who reflected on how Barbara Bush used to always keep score at his games, and then when, when they'd go to baseball games together, she would adamantly keep score, including at the World Series Game 5, 
when the uh, Astros played the Dodgers. And uh, and Ed was was her eyes because her eyesight had faded a bit. And she chastised him because he normally doesn't pay that much attention to the games and said, well, how am I supposed to keep score if you're not my eyes uh, as uh, President Bush sat right next to her? Uh, and it's something that she often did at his games at Yale and is a, a legacy that's continued on and a passion that's still very strong here at a and uh, When a and played Yale in 2016, uh, uh, President Bush donned a, a Yale hat and an a and shirt, and the Yale team actually wore the same baseball uniforms that he used to wear when he played for the team. So, so there are no hard feelings there, uh, but again, a lovely sort of memory of his legacy. And, and in thinking about, you know, in an interview, he was once asked, you know, who do you want to, who you see first when you go to heaven? And he mentioned first Robin, and then he said probably Barbara. So I can only help but imagine her also for sure putting her hand on her hip and and getting ready to keep score of whatever next adventure they go on. Uh, we are looking forward to helping and, and ushering you into what will be his final resting place later today. And uh, we'll keep you abreast of everything that's going on here, Libby. Back to you. Thanks so much, Nicole Ellis. The complexity of the way a man is remembered and the way a president is remembered uh, is, is no surprise because there is the legacy that's left behind to family, the legacy that's left behind through public service and the ethos of, of being called to serve, but also the ramifications of whatever decisions are made while in office. Um, the relationship that the president has with Republicans is so interesting, especially right now. And one can't help but notice the contrast between the Republicanism of old and the Republicanism of today. And even hearing John Meacham talk about the, the humility and the traits that Bush both admired and also embodied, it, it's so different than what politics is really about today, Eugene. Yeah, I, I have been paying attention perhaps to how many people, uh, be they first time voters in this last presidential election, or um, older Americans who just didn't vote regularly are probably learning about George H.W. Bush for the first time, which seems odd. Obviously, they're familiar with him. They know he was the president, but details of his policy, uh, his character, his behavior, his history, uh, it, it's, it's breaking news for, I think, a lot of people who perhaps did not pay attention to politics this closely in 1990. And so um, for those who perhaps are just engaging national politics for the first time in the last two years are, I think, being introduced with an idea that things don't have to be like this. Things can be um, a little more bipartisan and less uh, confrontational, even within someone else's uh, party. And I think what we see a lot of people who are, um, you know, recalling memories of Bush, be they uh, Democrats or Republicans, members of the media, academics or family members, is challenging voters and lawmakers to say, hey, we could pivot a bit. I mean, this is the first time. I think uh, there was a piece in the New York Yorker today that said it's really sad that it seems like the most uh, bipartisan moments in Washington recently are, are funerals. Mm -hmm. And I think this is showing voters that a way that um, things can change is they don't have to be. Perhaps this energy can carry on as we develop a new, welcome a new Congress and uh, get back to the policy making that ultimately affects everyone. Mm. We're watching the motorcade, and you can see some people lining the route to pay their respects as the casket of President George H.W. Bush moves through Houston, moves out of Houston, and heads to the railroad, where it will take its final journey to Texas A&M aboard George Bush 41. Uh, 41. Steve, you can't help but notice the contrast, though. Even as John Meacham was talking and the camera was, was looking around at the congregants there uh, in the National Cathedral yesterday, you see former presidents, and you see the current president, President mm. Trump, and you have to wonder what's going through his mind as he experiences this, this funeral service. Um, and and it, you can't help but, but draw contrasts between the 41st president and the 45th president. No, it's so interesting. I mean, people uh, here who have written stories of um, sort of lauding uh, President Bush have gotten some, some angry pushback from supporters of President Trump, uh, as if any praise of, of the one is a criticism of the other. But it does speak to the great contrast in the way they, they went about the job of being president. And I think what happens with funerals uh, uh, of, of statesmen is we begin to elevate the best parts of their 
their legacy mm -hmm. and their personality, and they, they stop being just people who have the job and they become models in some way, uh, ideals. And I think in the case of George H.W. Bush, it's, it's going to be that he was a person who did approach politics um, with all the requisite ambition and thirst for power, but with a humanity at the center that I think, um, I think um, many, many people are missing at this moment. Yeah, yeah. I uh, reflect on how often people talk about uh, the former President's Club being almost like a bit of a fraternity. Mm -hmm. And considering that he was one of the elders uh, of that group, one could argue that he, along with Carter, helped shape that uh, norm. Mm -hmm. When we see Clinton and when we see Obama and when we see W. Bush together laughing and smiling and reminding us that despite their disagreements, at the end of the day, they were motivated first by public service. Um, and I think, as you said, we cannot help but to reflect on our current political climate. Some are wondering, is that an organization, or not an organization, but a, a brotherhood that our current president will be welcomed in? Um, we have polling that shows that he is currently viewed as the most divisive president in recent history. Um, and so whether or not he can be um, reshaped in these moments as people reflect and he reflects on how he may be reflected upon <laughs> in his final days. Um, we, we will, we're in a place where we're wondering if things will change at all. Bill Eugene makes such a great point that the President's Club does not have to be a, a friendly club where people respect each other. And Bill Clinton pens an op-ed for The Washington Post talking about how he simply loved George H.W. Bush, a man he defeated. Mm -hmm. But a tone has been set by the by the elder statesmen, the likes of Carter, the likes of George H.W. Bush, and, and even George W. Bush as he brought together his father and Bill Clinton in public service. Let me, I think part of it is that once these people have had the job, it weighs upon them, they understand uh, what uh, it involves and what they've been through, and all of that for which they were responsible as president. And that has to change you. Hmm. You cannot, uh, one wonders if it will change the current right. president, mm -hmm. but you cannot really uh, shoulder that responsibility without understanding that in many ways, not the fate just of this country, but of the world hmm. hangs on your decisions. That's enough to make you stop and think that you have a lot in common with somebody who also held the job, even if that someone is from a different right. party. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I do think that uh, the way that President Trump has conducted himself during this week, as opposed to his his behavior during the funeral for John McCain, is is telling. And uh, he was much more sort of publicly aggrieved. I think he was described as peeved about the attention from McCain and the obvious uh, overt criticism of him that came. And this one, he's been much. There's been reporting about his mood, right. <laughs> as there always is. But publicly. Um, he has been a little bit distant in an appropriate way. He's been generous with the assets of, of you know, his office for the Bush family. And it's interesting that, that uh, he's perhaps taken a lesson from the last time. And it's and also part of the tone that the Bush family set That's themselves. what I was going to say. Yeah. I think that's because Bush set mm -hmm. that tone even in death, right? Mm -hmm. There was some wonder or doubt whether or not he would be invited, considering that he was not at the, the funeral of Barbara Bush. But in, in, it's almost as if Bush, in being not only a bigger person, was calling on Trump to say, hey, we believe that you can either be a bigger person or you need to be a bigger person for the <laughs> sake of the country mm -hmm. um, and, and let us gather in this moment of division as we move forward into the next year. Well, it started, I think, with uh, Bush wanting Trump to attend his funeral, making that very clear. Mm -hmm. And in a way, that sort of forces the president's hand, doesn't right. it? Mm -hmm. It does. Mm -hmm. They can't snipe from the outside if you're going to be on the inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Eugene Scott and Steve Hendricks for spending time with us, and I, I really recommend reading both of what you've been writing, Eugene, what you've been digging into the history, um, looking at some of the identity politics uh, surrounding President George H. W. Bush, and Steve, you've just written some beautiful pieces um, about uh, who this man was and what his relationships were with family. So thanks so much to both of you. Bill is sticking around, and let's head down to Lee Powell to hear his thoughts and reflections on, uh, on the philosophy of former President George H. W. Bush. Lee? Well, Libby, I have to tell you that the scene kind of behind me of the, the funeral procession, of course, has moved on to that train headed to College Station. But you can kind of uh, see behind me the guests of the uh, 
of the service. About 1,200 people, we were told, are, are still uh, coming out of uh, Saint uh, 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 the, 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 the church here. Uh, and uh, we've noted a couple of people in the crowd here at St. Martin's Cathedral, uh, the Episcopal Church. Uh, we saw, we see Chuck, we've seen Chuck Norris, but uh, we also see Yao Ming, who of course is the former uh, uh, NBA uh, basketball player, played for the Houston Rockets here, since retired. It's kind of hard to miss in that crowd because of his, of his height. So kind of gives you a sense of uh, the, the folks that uh, were invited. It was invitation only, of course, uh, here in Houston to, to this uh, morning service. Um, so gives you a sense of kind of the people that came out, a lot of uh, longtime Houstonians, people with a, a personal connection to the Bush family given their, given their presence here in Houston. And of course we uh, see that, uh, that procession, uh, that hearse uh, with the casket of uh, President George H.W. Bush inside headed to uh, the uh, train yard, headed to uh, it, then going to College Station on the Union Pacific Line. It's interesting that the this will be the first presidential uh, funeral train since 1969 for uh, when President Eisenhower uh, was laid to rest going from Washington back to Kansas. So uh, in the past, they were much more of a prominent thing uh, in terms of, of past presidents, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Abraham Lincoln, some most notable ones who uh, went back to be buried uh, by train. So uh, kind of a symbol of America's past. Uh, trains, of course, have not left us. They're still with us, uh, an important part of the economy, but something that you don't see very often when it comes to uh, presidential funerals, uh, kind of this sort of reviving that tradition, if you will. Um, I do want to leave you with something that, uh, in all the ways that, uh, you know, Bush has been remembered here, uh, something that struck out with me was something that he wrote to his uh, mother in a letter, kind of his life credo. Uh, and she bas he basically told her this is how he wanted to live his life or intended to live his life. And that was to tell the truth, don't blame people, be strong, do your best, try hard, forgive, and stay the course. So we've heard all kinds of refrains this week here in Houston, uh, sweetness and goodness, the end of an era, but duty, honor, and country, uh, the most prominent of those uh, being uh, when it comes to people remembering uh, the former president uh, here in his hometown of Houston. So uh, Libby, we'll send it back to you as, as the clouds uh, build and the rain starts to uh, become a little more uh, steady here uh, in Houston. Lee Powell, thank you so much. Bill and I are joined here on set by Lillian Cunningham, host of the Presidential and Constitutional Podcasts. Lillian, I listened last night to your podcast about President George H.W. Bush, because you've done podcasts now about all the presidents. That's right. Um, and they're such <laughs> wonderful deep dives. And despite the fact that I have been learning so much about the former president, talking so much about the former president, I still found so much that I learned from your podcast and, and so many details that stood out to me. And one was a quote that you had from a historian um, about you know, his, his demeanor and, and how, he, um, how he was perceived by the public and the press versus how he might have been more in his personal life. And you have even a quote from the former president himself saying, uh, I'm a quiet man, but I hear the quiet people others don't which I loved because it, it tries to take one of the things that people criticized about him and shows what an asset it can actually be. Yeah, I mean, I think for me too, that was one of the most interesting things to come out of this study of his presidency for the episode that I did, was just this, um, this difference between sort of Bush as he was perceived as president while in office, and then sort of the personal Bush that the people close to him knew and even, you know, strangers but who could meet him sort of one-on-one -on -one in a different setting would see of him. And, um, it, you know, as you said, he, he made that comment about himself being quiet. That was actually at his, um, his nominating uh, convention and he says, you know, I'm a bit awkward, <laughs> I'm not that eloquent, I'm quiet. <laughs> He recognized those things about himself. Um, and, you know, another thing that I found really interesting that a lot of his biographers pointed out, including John Meacham, who gave one of the eulogies yesterday at the National Cathedral, was this idea that he was intensely emotional, which 
it's interesting because as president, he was actually criticized a fair amount for being stoic and for, sh you know, um, not showing enough kind of empathy mm -hmm. with what the American public was going through during recessionary times. And yet, every historian I spoke to said, you know, he would, dr he would cry if a kitten showed up in front of him. He would cry if there was dew outside, that he just was incredibly sensitive and, and thoughtful and warm and emotional, but he had sort of this old school leadership style that um, in his mind he didn't think those were the type of character traits you exhibit as president. You hold all of that back. And you was that part of his upbringing, do you think? It sounded absolutely like that was part of it. it um, you know, his mom sort of famously said, you know, don't talk about yourself. N this isn't about you. Nothing's about you. And, um, and that, I think, is really in direct contrast to a leadership style we've seen in presidents in the past, but certainly in the 21st century and the, you know, from Bill Clinton onward that there's this sort of confessional politics right now and there's this sense that um, you know the leaders we elect we want to be charismatic we want to feel like they're human and Bush was you know he was our last uh, president to have served during World War II he was of a generation that just um, sort of you know Dwight Eisenhower was seen the same way like it is part of your leadership responsibility to be um, to be composed and to be sort of above that kind of personal sharing and emoting that we see today. You know, even a contrast to how Americans viewed his son, George W. Bush, in the White House, and people, you know, we all recall how people talked about how he was the guy you wanted to hang out with, right? He was the guy you wanted to have a beer with, um, and that did factor into Americans' minds as they thought about who they wanted to elect as the next president, Bill. No question about it. I mean, uh, George W. Bush, the second Bush president, was really a product of his Texas upbringing, mm -hmm. as opposed to his father's sort of patrician East Coast background. And uh, the difference was very pronounced. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't at all put on. Uh, he was, George W. Bush was much more uh, in the mold of most American men, and they could relate to him. It was a guy who was lucky enough to be a part owner of a baseball team, got to sit in the owner's mm -hmm. box, uh, you know, every game. Yeah, I can't really relate to that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, but we all wish <laughs> sure, we could, right. right. Yeah, aspirational, right. aspirational. Um, Bill, did the press have a sense of this depth that George H.W. Bush had, the, 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 the nuance, his emotional side? Um, and was that something that was shared with the American people? We knew that he was emotional. Uh, you could see it, uh, as, as, little point, as you pointed out, uh, it was uh, only it was only covered up really in in public. Uh, he would he could tear up easily, and I think everybody understood that he was fairly emotional guy. But we all knew that he didn't show it. There's a there's a great story that John Meacham told on the podcast about um, at the fall of the Berlin Wall. You know the reporters were in the Oval Office and saying like, you know, this is this huge symbolic moment and full of emotion. And I think it was Leslie Stahl who asked the president, you know, how are you feeling? What do you think? You don't seem too excited by this. And, it was Leslie. And he said, and, you know, President <coughs> Bush said, well, I guess I'm just not that much of an emotional guy and it's getting kind of late in the evening and <laughs> a little tired and I guess that's why I just don't look too emotional, but, you know, with some hindsight, we know that behind all of that was a lot of emotion and a lot of strategy about, you know, why he didn't want to make a bigger show of victory, but... Um, was that strategy recognized at the time, Bill? The, it was commented on, but probably, uh, I think, recognized by those who were, who were studying what was really going on mm. in Europe, who realized that it probably wouldn't have been a good idea to exult uh, in the fall of the Berlin Wall and the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, but not so much domestically, no. 
Mm. Lillian, something else you talk about in your podcast, Presidential, is how the resume of George H.W. Bush was basically unparalleled. When he comes into office as president, he has done so much that has prepared him for that role. And you liken it to early presidents who had this very beefed up portfolio before they assumed the office of the presidency. Right. Well, that was one of the sort of interesting values of going back and you know, one by one <laughs> studying each president is that you start to identify um, parallels, you know, with m more modern presidents and presidents uh, we had early on in our history. And that was a really interesting thing that stood out to me that, you know, Bush had a, a breadth of public service experience before becoming president that really did, um, resemble in a lot of ways the resumes that we saw in the first half of the 19th century. Um, so people like Thomas Jefferson and John Quincy Adams, James Buchanan, um, you know, Bush had military experience. We've heard a lot about over the past few days, his time as a, a bomber pilot when he was young in World War II. He had legislative experience as a congressman. He had diplomatic experience, ambassador to the UN, and an envoy to China, and political experience, um, vice president, of course, but he was appointed director of the CIA. And, you know, that kind of sort of wide ranging resume was a lot more popular at, you know, in the first 50 years or so of our country. Mm -hmm. And then, obviously, with Lincoln, we had a president who had just some legislative experience really before serving um, and kind of as we've gone up through the latter part of the 19th century into the 20th century certainly now into the 21st century um, it's just rarer and rarer to see someone who's held sort of all of those varied public service careers um, so his election 30 years ago now marks really the last time we've seen that sort of traditional statesman resume and someone we've elected the let's, office. Let's head back down to Texas where Nicole Ellis is at Texas A&M site of the Presidential <clears throat> Library. Nicole, how are Texans honoring uh, this man today? Hi, Libby. They are honoring him in every possible way. Uh, in Houston, I mentioned socks here at A&M. Uh, you'll probably see people holding up the Gigum sign for A&M, or Aggies, as they're called uh, by alumni and by students themselves. Uh, something that uh, that sort of sticks out to me, I know you have Lillian Cunningham with you, um, and from her podcast, Presidential, she has a historic question that she asks, and I believe it was John Meacham's response. Um, and, and he says that, you know, he saw President, or President Bush was at dinner and saw a young man who was clearly nervous and waiting for a date. And when she arrived, he uh, he pulled the he pulled the chair for her, made sure she was seated comfortably, paid for dinner. And President uh, George H. W. Bush walked over to her and said, "Let your parents know that the president approves, or that President George H. W. Bush approves." And that's sort of how he's remembered here at A and M as well. He was so accessible to students, and as uh, as special as the sort of special plane forty one forty one. Uh, flew over their memories and recollections of students clamoring and climbing over pickup trucks and students who came to the school because they knew that they would see President Bush or meet him uh, because he was so accessible. Um, so there's so many different memories here and, and a true sadness among students about losing someone that's been a part of their lives. For some of them, you know, the 20 years that his school has been here and beyond because he's known to just pop up at the rec center or the gym or football games or baseball games. Um, so that's definitely on the minds of so many students here. And uh, as the train passes through and makes its way to College Station, I'm sure you'll be seeing lots of gigums. Back to you, Libby. Nicole Ellis, thank you so much. Lillian, something else that you uh, talk about on your podcast series, Presidential, you have this funny but very revealing question. Uh, if I was set up on a blind date with this president, what would it be like? Uh, first of all, why do you ask that question? And then second of all, what did you learn about George H.W. Bush? Yeah, so I, I started asking that question in the first episode with George Washington. And I sort of just asked it to, for fun to see what the response would be from, uh, you know, I think there's sort of this image that presidential history um, 
can be sort of stuffy and dense. And so it occurred to me as an interesting way just to um, sort of lighten the conversation, but, but more importantly. And also get at the personality. Yeah, more yeah. importantly to, to sort of reveal something about who these figures were beyond um, just that public persona. Um, so that was really the hope in the question was to get a sense of, you know, what are they like as people? What would it, you know, bring, I would ask historians, you know, bring this person to life for me. Um, and it got a range of very interesting revealing responses, you know, president after president. Um, but certainly for George H.W. Bush, the sort of responses that I got were, as Nicole mentioned, this sense of, you know, manners, etiquette, a kindness, um, a courtesy, all of that came up. Um, also, you know, we talked about his sensitivity and emotion. Um, that also came up as something that would be revealed, like, on a date or in a coffee or some sort of one-on-one -on -one meeting with him that you wouldn't see um, in his presidency as you know the American public. Um, they also talked about how he was a really great listener, and while he could be you know a little ineloquent um, as president, that a great strength of his was that if you were having a conversation with him, he really listen to you and he was engaged and interested and um, so those were nice sort of details to have come through. And Bill, listening, a skill uh, often found to be in short supply here in Washington. He listened to things very carefully. I can remember <laughs> one time when he, because he, he was equally concerned about his, his people. Uh, apparently I asked uh, a question of the State Department spokesperson Margaret Tutwiler that, or I was badgering her perhaps, <laughs> that was considered important. He saw this. I learned later from Margaret, months later, and he didn't like it. And I wondered why, at a couple of opportunities when I was near him, he sort of turned away from me. He literally wasn't speaking to me because I had been rude to Margaret. I didn't know this at the time, but I found out later and uh, uh, he eventually came back around, and I was duly chastened. How did that play out? I mean, did that did you did you ever talk to him about it, or just sort of moved on? I and... talked to Margaret about okay. it. Okay. Uh, and I didn't talk to him about it. It all worked out. <laughs> we, we reporters are a pain in the neck. But as we've learned from journalists who covered him closely, including I, I know we heard earlier from Sally about the Marine Dowd column that was in the New York Times this weekend, how they had this antagonistic relationship, and yet she got so many heartfelt, hilarious letters from George H.W. Bush needling her, chastising her, praising her, and it showed this real relationship that was built up over time, and there are other journalists who had that that same experience. And James Baker, someone we heard from today and we've been talking about all week because he played such a crucial role in the presidency of George H.W. Bush, also Ronald Reagan, as well as in the personal life of former President George H.W. Bush. James Baker gave one of the eulogies today, and I, and I want to go back and play some of the highlights of, of his remembrances of his good friend, who he, uh, in later years, called Hefe. As we have heard and as we know, George Bush was a charter member of the greatest generation. As we gather here to salute him, his incredible service to our nation and the world are already etched in the marble of time. After becoming the youngest naval aviator, he served in increasingly responsible positions on behalf of his country, congressman, ambassador to China and to the United Nations, director of the CIA, and vice president. Then, as history will faithfully record, he became one of our nation's finest presidents and beyond any doubt, our nation's very best one-term president. For millions and millions across the globe, the world became a better place because George Bush occupied the White House for four years. He was not considered a skilled speaker, but his deeds were quite eloquent. And he demonstrated their eloquence 
by carving them into the hard granite of history. They expressed his moral character, and they reflected his decency, his boundless kindness and consideration of others, his determination always to do the right thing and always to do that to the very best of his ability. They testify to a life nobly lived. He possessed the classic virtues of our civilization and of his faith, the same virtues that express what is really best about this country. These same ideals were known to and they were shared by our founding fathers. Baker utilizing his longtime friend, the former president. You know, they often say you learn a lot about someone by who they surround themselves with and who they keep company with. Bill Plant. What do we learn about President George H.W. Bush based on who he surrounded himself over the decades? He had advisors around him, who, many of whom uh, came from distinctly different backgrounds, but he valued, he valued their uh, advice and experience. Uh, for example, Dick Cheney, um, Don Rumsfeld, uh, people who uh, People whose backgrounds were not like his necessarily, but whose experience he valued, and he was uh, he was always willing to reach out and find someone else who could help, uh, and he was it never seemed to matter to him, you know, where they went to school, for example. Baker talked about during his eulogy that. One thing that President Bush liked best was to have a conversation, get the feedback, and then uh, eventually, when it was time to shut it down, he'd shut it down and say something to the effect of, you know, if, if you're so smart, why am I president of the United States? But he did value that honesty in counsel, Lillian. Yeah, I think it's also interesting and important to remember that um, when he wasn't president, he sort of did the same in return for a lot of other figures in Washington. Um, so he, you know, he served as Reagan's vice president, of course, for eight years, and he had lost election to Reagan, but, um, you know, he made a point of saying he, you know, he, he said this, I think, in his diary, that he did not want to be the type of vice president who a president had to worry about. Mm. He, what was in the past was in the past. Um, he saw himself as a wingman, and in you know all the roles that he held in Washington, you see that his sense of loyalty is not just a loyalty to people who you know work for him or with him. It's also a loyalty that he showed to the people he worked for and served. Um, and his, his opinion of voodoo economics never really changed. But he never repeated the phrase again mm -hmm. after getting on the ticket with Reagan, mm. for example. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I confessed the other day that I thought it was called voodoo economics when I was younger. I mean, I, I, that, that name was such a, such a great, it was such a great moniker for Reagan's theory of economics that I actually thought it was called that um, <laughs> when I was young. Um, and yet he, he really abandoned that. Uh, publicly in order to get on Team Reagan and become a loyal vice president, Bill. He was, uh, at his core, a very loyal guy. As you covered the Reagan presidency, how did that, that vice president fit into the, the, the scheme of Washington? The vice president's job is, uh, as we all know, really amorphous. You don't really know what you're supposed to do except hang around in case the president dies. Um, in, in George Bush's case, uh, he went to all of those places that a president was invited but couldn't or didn't want to go. For instance, the leader of a small country dies. Does the president go to the funeral? No. In, in Bush's office, they used to say, if you die, we fly. And he would go. And the vice presidents do all of these uh, small tasks, many would say meaningless, although not necessarily. Uh, that the president doesn't want to do. We're watching the motorcade arrive in Spring, Texas. Uh, this is going to be Spring Station, uh, where uh, the casket of the former president will be loaded onto this train, and it will take its final journey to Texas A&M up at College Station. Um, so you can see there uh, 
this this honor, this moment of uh, of anticipation as the hearse and motorcade uh, are getting ready to pull in. Members of the military represented there, waiting in some light rain in Spring, Texas. Full honor guard. Full honor guard, Bill. Um, it, there was a scare during the Reagan presidency when Reagan was shot. And there was the real question about whether he would survive and, and, and whether George Bush would, would have to assume the presidency. But it, it, historical reports show that he was very sort of judicious and measured in how he handled those early hours and days. This is how judicious he was about that. He was on a trip uh, headed toward Asia uh, when Reagan was shot. They turned the plane around, of course, and it took him a while to get back. He landed at Andrews Air Force Base, now Joint Base Andrews, and they wanted him to take a helicopter to the White House. He refused. He went to the White House by motorcade because he said the vice president doesn't land on the White House lawn. Only the president lands on the White House lawn. That's how judicious he was. And was he concerned that would be read as a signal by the American public that Reagan's condition was worse than it was or that the situation was extremely dire? I think it, that may have been part of the calculus, but it was also part of the fact that he didn't think that he, as vice president, really should take the helicopter to the White House. It could also be seen as a power play in, 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 in an inopportune moment, right. really. And uh, in fact, <laughs> you had uh, people, actually it was me, asking uh, Alexander Haig who was in charge, and he said that he was. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. but uh, next in line. He wasn't, but that's all right. Lillian, uh, as you reflect on the moments that formed George H.W. Bush as a person, what are, what are some of the political moments or some of those jobs that he had before becoming president that, that formed him? We've been talking a lot today about the personal formation of, of the man, but what are some of the political moments that formed him? So I think one thing, actually, a bit tied to what Bill just mentioned about, you know, as vice president, that he had sort of the you know, l low duty of flying around the world when a small dignitary died. You know, between that, but then also his role as ambassador to the UN and to China, you know, part of, I think, what um, politically happened to him through those experiences was the building of a global Rolodex. You know, he had, he was known for having good relationships with world leaders and um, an ability to, you know, and this goes partly also to just a personality trait that he had of uh, being able to sort of make friendships, keep friendships. Um, but those, those global experiences, I think, did, um, did sort of craft him into a, a sort of a diplomatic figure who knew how to converse, knew how to, um, you know, sort of work deals behind the scenes. So I think that was one um, sort of formative part of his political experience. I'm curious what you'd think, too, Bill. From no doubt about it. He was very uh, conversant in foreign affairs uh, and uh, showed that when he became president. In fact, he was criticized as president for spending perhaps more time on foreign affairs than domestic, mm -hmm. particularly toward the end of his term uh, when the economy uh, had gone south. Uh, but he was uh, seen to be, not necessarily true, but seen to be more concerned with conditions in Europe. We're watching images from Spring, Texas, and that's where the train is waiting. And we can see the locomotive there, 4141, and it will carry President George H.W. Bush on his final journey to his resting place at Texas A&M. That's the site of the presidential library. You can see the full honor guard there. And you know, we, we will once again hear Hail to the Chief played, Bill and Lillian, and that those four ruffles and, and flourishes uh, that precedes it as we have another moment to honor a man who served as commander-in-chief, one of only 45 people to do so. Lillian, as you reflect on what it means to be president of this country and the history that comes with it, what does it mean for America to, to pause in this moment and recognize and honor one of the presidents? I think that um, a piece of what we're sort of collectively doing right now is um, 
something that I, I sort of feel like I went through the experience a bit of doing and in, in creating an episode for him, you know, before he passed, um, which is in part reflecting on just sort of how his legacy has started to shift and, mm -hmm. you know, the time since he's held office. And a an interesting thing I think that, you know, we hear a lot of people reflecting on is sort of the, the chapter ending that he represents in sort of the story of the American presidency. And, you know, it was near the end of the 20th century, but he was also the last president to have served in World War II. He was the last president we had before cable news dominated and really transformed the media landscape that presidents have to operate in. Um, he was also, I think, at, at least to date, sort of the last of a certain type of conservative leader, and not just conservative in terms of politics and, you know, what policies he thought should be in place, um, but also just a conservative leadership style. You know, he saw his responsibility in the office as um, not being someone to change the system. I mean, he said himself, you know, I'm not here to start a revolution. I'm, I don't have any, you know, grand plans to shake things up. He thought that on the whole, democracy worked and the system worked and capitalism worked. And, you know, given his background, um, all of that had sort of worked for him. And he, he saw his role as president as really someone who um, would sort of shepherd America along the course it was kind of already going and, mm. and steer it when it got a bit off course or right the ship if it started to tip. Um, but that's a different conservatism than we mm -hmm. even see in his son, you know. Mm -hmm. the, it's, he was sort of before the partisan, the type of partisanship we see today and the type of, you know, media environment we see today. And it was a different style that I think we're remembering. The way we assess our presidents has always changed over time. Mm. If you look back uh, at Harry Truman, for example, he was widely regarded at the end uh, of his presidency as kind of a failure, but, uh, but now is regarded as uh, having had a very productive presidency. Same with Eisenhower, uh, who was considered bland and kind of old-fashioned, <laughs> now considered uh, to have been uh, much more effective than we thought. It's interesting, perhaps history has speeded up a little bit along with cable news, uh, but the assessment of George H.W. Bush uh, in the eyes of a bi biographer like John Meacham may have already caught up a little bit, but probably still has a ways to go. It is fascinating, Lillian, to hear you talk about the intention with which George H.W. Bush operated that was perhaps seen by some in the media or some in the public as like lack of inertia or lack of aggressive action was, was quite intentional. And seeing your role in history and seeing your role and when you keep your hands off versus when you put your hands on is something that's done in a judicious way. I want to point out that the motorcade, of course, is arriving there in Spring, Texas. And here's a little bit about what we'll be seeing uh, over the next little while as this honor guard awaits uh, the arrival fully of the motorcade and the hearse. The casket will be carried between the ranks of that honor cordon and placed in the funeral car of the train. And as we heard earlier, there is a window on that car so Texans, Americans can, can watch and pay their respects as it rolls by at a slower than normal speed to allow for that time. Um, we'll see members of the procession proceed through national color, military and civilian clergy, and then the casket in presidential color. And then the Bush family will board the train and depart for College, St College Station, Texas, rather, and you'll see the journey right there on your screen, the 75-mile funeral train route as it heads up to College Station at Texas A&M and the final resting place. We expect this to be about a two-and-a-half-hour trip, um, taking its time uh, so that people can, for one last time, pay their respects before the final resting place at Texas A&M. 
And, and then the Presidential Library will continue to do what it's already been doing, which is via, via location um, for knowledge and information, history, uh, but also a place now to finally pay your respects to George H.W. Bush and, uh, and his wife, Barbara, and their daughter, Robin. That's where he will be buried alongside of them. Presidential Libraries serve the public uh, to remind them of the history. They also serve scholars uh, who have a chance to delve more deeply into the records of an administration. So it's uh, something that he undoubtedly would have wanted because he spoke actually often of his, of his library. And we heard earlier how involved he was in the creation of it and how he decided on Texas A&M as opposed to Rice in Houston or University of Texas. Lillian, what is the role of the Presidential Library from, from your perspective in terms of some of what it gives to the public as Bill was just talking about? Well, I can say from personal experience that it was, they, you know, a number of the presidential libraries were incredible resources for me in trying to put together uh, this podcast on the American presidency. Um, you know, they're just not only, of course, all of the records that they keep, um, which are invaluable, but, you know, the people there are incredible historians of these figures and many of them are not the the voice the you know the names we know mm -hmm. who've written the definitive biographies of the presidents but they're people who've you know dedicated their lives to studying these figures preserving presidential history um, so I of course found them to be incredibly uh, useful and helpful resources The Bush family on hand, you see there former President George W. Bush, former First Lady Laura Bush, members of the clergy from St. Martin's coming by as well. Such an intense and what must be an exhausting day for the Bush family, Bill. These uh, events are never easy even when they're not in the glare of the national spotlight. You can only imagine how much uh, it takes out of them to have gone through this over a period of days with these two large services and the nation watching. There have been so many moments of passage and ritual. Uh, the plane leaving Joint Base Andrews was a goodbye from Washington, the, the final departure of this former president from the area he served for so long here in the nation's capital. And this is a final goodbye from the Houston area. When he left, when his casket left uh, Houston on um, yesterday after, I mean, left the National Cathedral, sorry, after yesterday's service in Washington, 
uh, as uh, as it headed toward the plane at Joint Base Andrews, we heard the strains of the hymn "Going Home." Mm. And now that he's here in Texas, this is the home he chose. The Bush family will now board the train as it prepares to depart for College Station, Texas. And this locomotive has been specially designed and decorated uh, to honor President George H.W. Bush. It's called 4141 in honor of the 41st president. And you can see those beautifully painted, custom painted panels that, that feature elements from the Air Force One wings and tail design and the American flag. and. Uh, and it also uses the colors that were from Air Force One back when George H.W. Bush was president. 
of the United States. It's a locomotive, by the way, which George H.W. Bush actually drove. He was fascinated by it. Uh, they let him drive it after taking a quick safety course. Uh, <laughs> he drove it for about 10 miles, I think. We've heard a lot of the last few days about how he loved speed, whether it was his speedboat or whether it was like a, a, a speed round on the golf course. Uh, this locomotive will go a little slower than, uh, than its capabilities, just so that Americans, Texans in particular, have a chance to pay their respects and say goodbye as it rolls through Texas, Bill. We, uh, we know that people will gather and they're supposed to be able to see through an observation window mm -hmm. uh, the coffin resting on the, on the beer inside that uh, railroad car. Lillian, final thoughts from you as you prepare to watch the train leave the station. Um, well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, one thing that I haven't mentioned before, but that are just, I think, some interesting details just in a historical kind of context for Bush are, you know, some of the the rarities of his presidency and, you know, the first being that he's one of only two presidents to have a child who's president. So this, you know, this, um, this occasion of a president, you know, seeing uh, his his father's funeral as president is just um, is something we never really experience in American history. John Adams and John Quincy Adams are the only other father and son pair who've held the office. So um, it's a unique moment. Um, and you know, also another just rarity of his presidency in historical context is that we've had very few presidents who were vice presidents who went on to be elected, um, win election out of the vice presidency to become president. And, you know, we have certainly haven't had that since Bush and before Bush. We hadn't had that since 1836 mm. with Martin Van Buren. Wow. So there are, um, in addition to, you know, everything else we've talked about with Bush's legacy in life, there are also just a few, um, a few things that make this presidency and sort of this memorial and remembrance unique in our nation's history. We'll get ready to watch Locomoto 4141 leave Spring, Texas, as it makes this final journey carrying President George H.W. Bush uh, to Texas A&M to College Station. I want to thank Lillian Cunningham so much for being with us. She's the host of the Washington Post podcast, Constitutional and Presidential, where you can learn all about the presidents, including President 41. And thanks also to Bill Plant, a longtime Washington correspondent who's been with us the last couple of days. Thanks so much, Bill. It's been invaluable to hear your memories My and pleasure. historical perspective. Uh, thank you. We'll continue to bring you these live images as the locomotive prepares to leave spring and then makes its journey. And we'll be back here on air later on this afternoon for the arrival at Texas A&M uh, as um, the body of President George H.W. Bush prepares for internment as the family prepares to say their final goodbyes uh, before burial on the grounds of the presidential library. And we'll just keep bringing you these images right here live uh, of the train as it makes its way and as Texans are able to pay their final respects to the former president who considered Texas his adopted home. So stay with us uh, as we continue our coverage this afternoon of the funeral proceedings for the former president, George H.W. Bush. Thanks so much for watching.
someone to drive the ID car.
You're watching live coverage from the Washington Post of this week of mourning and celebration of the life of the former president, George H.W. Bush. You're seeing these wonderful images of the train 4141, this locomotive that is carrying the casket of President 41 uh, to his final resting place in College Station, Texas. I'd like to welcome my guests here on set with me today. Tom Collimore served as Chief of Staff and Assistant Secretary of Commerce in the George H.W. Bush administration. Uh, also spent a lot of time uh, with Vice President Bush, um, currently counselor to the President of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Thanks so much for being here, Tom. Real pleasure. We're so glad to have you on set. And Carlos Lozada, our nonfiction book critic. Thank you, Carlos, for being Thanks, here as well. It's been amazing to watch this train journey from so many different vantage points, but especially seeing it as we're like along for the ride on the train, seeing Texans and Americans there waving flags, um, waving to the people on the train, saluting. You can only imagine what it's like for the Bush family because they're on the train as well, Tom. Oh, I think this is a, a deeply poignant moment for the family. And they know that President Bush would have loved this really? trip. Really? He would have loved this trip. He, you know, I went with him to countless rallies with Texans and Americans just like that. Yeah. And it fired him up, and he loved to work the rope line and greet as many people as he could. And I, I tell you, I rode on this exact same train with a few extra cars to the dedication of the library many years ago. And the president spent the whole time out the window, waving out the window. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I'm sure that the family is quite touched by this outpouring of support and love along the way. And you're on the advisory board to the Presidential Library. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What does it mean to have this as the final resting place of President Bush? Oh, you know, it means the world. Uh, Texas A&M was a place dear to his heart. Uh, he really connected with the Aggies uh, and the Aggie community. Um, and he was thrilled that there's a part of Texas A&M that is called Bush School of Public Service. Mm -hmm. And they are churning out the next generation of servant leaders for our government. And uh, very important to them. So much of uh, these days of mourning have, well, they've had private ceremonies, private funerals. They, they've been very public because we've gotten to share in the experience. We've gotten to all watch what happened at National Cathedral yesterday at St. Martin's in, in Houston this morning. But the burial this evening will be private. So we'll be able to see the train arrive in College Station. Uh, we'll see once again ritual uh, take place as the casket is removed from the train and then driven uh, to Texas A&M and the final resting place. But the burial itself will be private, Tom. I, I think that's quite appropriate, actually. Th this is a family who has um, shared their guy with the public for most of their lives. And uh, I think every family deserves that private moment as well at the end. So. Oh boy, Tom talked about how the family has been sharing the former president with us, Carlos, and you wrote this great piece uh, over this past week about the writings of George H.W. Bush. Mm -hmm. And as the nonfiction book critic, you put it so well that, that there is a, a piece missing, a memoir missing, that he never penned. Um, mm -hmm. And we have so much of his writing because he wrote a lot of letters. Yes. Um, we have letters dating back to when he was courting Barbara. Uh, and we have letters that he was writing to people, including our fellow our fellow journalist colleagues, just, uh, you know, in the last few months, really. But he never t took the time to write out the memoir that, that mm -hmm. you say you would have loved to have read. I think it fits with his zone of privacy that you're talking about, right? The um, he always, uh, his mother always told him, you know, there's a little too much I in that speech, George, you know, whenever he would talk too much about himself. Uh, and so he had a kind of ghost-written campaign memoir in, in the late 80s. Um, he co-wrote a book with Brent Scowcroft on sort of the foreign policy, the end of the Cold War. Well, you point out the Scowcroft um, passages were better written. <laughs> so. Well, you know, he, he always is a little bit reticent, I think, the, the, the president uh, himself. Um, you know, where you, where you glimpse him most clearly, I think, is in two other books. One was a, a book that was based on his diaries from his time as the U.S. envoy to China in the, in the mid-70s, when he literally just sort of dictates, you know, into a microphone uh, and, and jots down ideas. And then this, this book of letters um, that ranges from um, really his, his, you know, his earliest days when he's, you know, on the USS Finback after being rescued. Uh, you know, by, by the U.S. sub after being shot down um, through the, you know, watching his, his son become president and, and deal with 9-11. And so there's a lot, a lot there to, to draw upon. 
but um, he's, when people would urge him to write a, a memoir, he just said, no, I, w I was unpersuaded. Enough people are going to be, be writing about me. But when you take all these books together, uh, you do see that I think there could have been a memoir that could have really recast him in, in some ways. He is often regarded as this kind of like patrician, waspy, removed, you know, character. And you see in his letters how he really grappled with that. He was uncomfortable early on with the, some of the, the, the privileges and advantages he received, uh, you know, as a, as a young man. Um, he, these are things that, that only come across when you really kind of dive into this, this material. But it was all there. It was all there. And so that's why I kind of had this, this sort of nostalgic feeling that could have been a great presidential memoir. The guilt and baggage that can come with being given a lot is something that I think we, we, we're conscious of in our culture mm -hmm. today. Um, but, but that is something that you point out uh, he was grappling with years ago. Even, yeah, he, before it sort of became the fashion. When he, when he finishes Yale, he's writing, he's trying to figure out what to do next, and he, he writes to a friend, you know, like, I feel comfortable, um, you know, doing well just because I went to some of the same debutante parties as some of my clients, yeah. you know? Um, and, but you, you see glimpses of him that I don't think are, are um, sort of very well known. He, um, you know, he famously did not advance into Iraq into Baghdad during the Gulf War, right? And so that led to a lot of easy comparisons between father and son. You know, the, uh, the, the, the prudent Bush 41, the reckless Bush 43. And yet in, um, in the foreign policy book with, with Scowcroft, you see that um, Bush 41 really came to see Saddam Hussein and Iraq uh, in very kind of moralizing, moralistic terms that echo some of the Bush 43 uh, rhetoric. Uh, to the point that at one point in one of Brent Scowcroft's passages, he says, you know, I was worried that he was getting too emotionally involved in, uh, in, in this sort of, you know, confrontation with, with Saddam Hussein. But even the, you know, even then the, the, the president wrote, look, I was just worried about entering some unwinnable guerrilla war, you know, uh, in an urban setting. Um, but there's more nuance there. You know, it's, it's not as simple as those easy distinctions. I'd like to welcome Robert Costa to our set, a national uh, political reporter. It's so great to have you here, Bob, uh, joining our panel. What's standing out to you as, we, as we've been going through this national week of mourning and as we get to watch all these Texans greeting the train as it rolls in the college station? What's on your mind? Well, beyond all the personal stories, there's the political story of George H.W. Bush and he was on a national ticket four times, vice presidential nominee in 80 and 84, presidential nominee in 1988 and 1992. I mean, that really rivals Richard Nixon for someone who's been on a Republican ticket. Nixon, I believe, was on five times uh, as a national candidate. And so you have someone, even though he's low key in his persona, was really high profile Republican for decades, driving the party, uh, was part of the evolution of the Republican party, moving away from as Carlos was talking about his patrician background, moving physically to Texas and being part of that Sunbelt evolution of the GOP that led to Ronald Reagan and, in a sense, to George H.W. Bush. Tom, the, the George Bush that we're all learning about now and, and talking about now uh, is, an, is a nuanced and complicated man. Of course, I think a lot has been made of, of some of the more the modest parts of him, not talking about himself a lot. But as Carlos points out, his writings do show a man who had a lot of confidence. I mean, you don't run for president. You don't run for house even if you're not someone that's imbued with, with confidence, whether it's through your upbringing or whether it's through um, what other people have told you you are capable of doing. Where did that come from for him? Yeah, I would mention, you, you heard the Jim Baker vignette today, you know, when he was done with the debate, you know, if you're so smart, how come I'm president and you're not? So he'd welcome he, the debate, but then at the end of the day, he knew how to shut it down. Yes, he did. He did. But he, he was, uh, to Robert's point, he was a very competitive hmm. individual as well. And uh, uh, he, he was very focused on you know, what it took to get into office so that he could then govern. And he, he did see a big difference between politics and governing, sometimes to his detriment, right? But uh, he had a great respect for the office and for the responsibilities in a way that perhaps, you know, was unique to his generation. The relationship to Texas, his adopted home state, uh, where he will be interred, can you tell us a little bit, Tom, about how he felt about Texas? Texas was home, clear and simple. You know, for years, our, our friends in the press would claim, oh, come on, he's really a New England patrician. He's going to go back to Connecticut. The library will be at Yale, whatever it may be. 
and he had a plot of land. He bought a lot in Houston because when he was vice president and president, he used to stay in a hotel in Houston. And no one really believed he would build a house on that lot. They thought it was a big feint. But, you know, he started building as soon as he lost. And they rented a house, and they went back home, and they built their home, and there he stayed, uh, except in the summer months when he was in Maine. But he, he loves Texas culture, Texas people, Texas food, uh, the whole bit. And we heard this morning uh, St. Martin's his home for 50 uh, years, a place that he belonged to. He worshiped for 50 years, and we saw Reba McIntyre perform, we saw the Oak Ridge Boys perform, um, uh, part of the culture for him as well. And the, the morning after he was elected President of the United States, he went to St. Martin's for a special service mm -hmm. with that congregation, not with a political group, with the congregation before he got on the plane to come home to Washington as President-elect. Well, as the locomotive runs into, rolls into College Station, let's go to our colleague Nicole Ellis, who is live there at Texas A&M. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Libby. Yes, I am live at Texas A&M, right outside of the Bush Library and Museum. Uh, I'm sure you, you can't see it right now, but uh, but the prelude that will start as soon as things kick off here at A&M will be from the Singing Cadets and the Fighting Texas Aggie Band, uh, the official marching band of Texas A&M. And they're actually known for incredible and exquisite um, sort of performances and marching. Uh, it's composed of about 300 members of the school's Corps of Cadets. Uh, and it's also, at one point, it was one of the largest military marching bands in the world, uh, which is very much so fitting with President Bush's sort of love for not only A&M, but Texas. And specifically when it comes to A&M, uh, their rich tradition of military excellence. Um, uh, you know, you can't really see it right now, but there is there is a line of Texas A&M cadets uh, that will sort of be a part of that last tail end of his motorcade as it as it sort of files in right behind me, uh, and that will be also be consistent with um, with similarities in Barbara Bush's procession and having the cadets involved there. Um, so there's a lot going on here right now. We'll definitely continue to update you as things unfold uh, and keep you posted. All right, you can see there are so many people gathered um, at Texas A&M to, to watch this historic moment. Tom, you traveled with uh, President Bush, Vice President Bush. I have here that you visited more than 30 countries in all 50 states as part of the, the Bush team. A lot of moving around. A lot of moving around. <laughs> what was he like to travel with? Oh, he was a, a delight, frankly, for the staff uh, because he understood that we were all in the middle of a very unique and stressful experience and he did his best to keep it loose mm -hmm. and uh, you know very much like his son later did uh, most people had nicknames and uh, particularly the the press that would travel with us had nicknames and uh, um, he would uh, you know just try to make sure everyone was comfortable and not feeling the stress too much but I, I have to say I said this to a friend of mine the other day um, so in one of the eulogies yesterday, someone said, you know, there are hundreds of people out there, literally, who felt like he was their second father, a father figure, a mentor. And it was certainly true for the staff as well. You just didn't want to get, you know, that look or, <laughs> you know, have him convey any sort of disappointment. I mean, it'd be devastating. He never raised his voice. He never uh, was overly demanding. But you knew what was expected. Uh, one time we were in China, a quick story, and um, it was a grueling schedule, and he had a state dinner, and a vice premier was uh, introducing him, and he had the toast, and the card said vice minister. Well, there's a big difference between vice minister and vice premier, and when you've been traveling all night to China and you're a little jet lagged, you might actually make the mistake. He fixed it on the fly, uh, but I heard about it. Oh, day. no. Yes, you yes, did. yes. And that, what you did know, it mean to hear about it? Um, a stern, fatherly talking to. Directly from him, not direct, from an intermediary. Oh, or, directly, yes, mm -hmm. well, quite directly. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing we shouldn't let happen. And he would yeah. know as a former envoy. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, well, luckily, he, he was the best uh, proofreader available for that particular impact, in, incident. So. I mean, we've been hearing so much about how he, he was, like, the best trained person for the job of the presidency because he had so much build up in his career to that moment, Carlos. Well, I mean, there's all this, uh, I mean, so, right, two-term congressman, Ran for Senate twice, didn't win, but ran for Senate twice. Um, you know, uh, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, head of the RNC during Watergate. Watergate. Not an easy time yeah. to do. He called it a nightmare uh, in his in his in his diaries. Uh, envoy to China, head of the CIA. I mean, it's hard to imagine 
um, a, a more prepared uh, person to run for president. Um, you know, but one of the, when, when you were mentioning those, uh, the, the travel and trying to keep it light, those little moments, it reminds me in, not in one of his books, but in one of, um, uh, John Sununu, uh, who was his chief of staff, wrote a memoir about him uh, recently, just a couple of years ago, called The Quiet Man. Um, that the memoir itself is not very quiet. Sununu is, 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 is very strident um, on, on many points. But um, he has a wonderful story about um, you know, some summit meeting in, in Europe. And uh, it's Sununu is with Scowcroft and President Bush. And they see, as, as Mulroney spoke during the, uh, dur during the, the service yesterday, uh, that Bush was, t you know, writing on down all these, all these you know, copious notes and, and seemed very diligent, um, and then passes them on to Sununu and to Scowcroft um, as if they were sort of very, you know, important and serious notes. In fact, he was um, writing limericks about the other world oh, leaders, no. you know. Um, <laughs> there once was a chancellor from Bonn, you know, like that's how they would begin. Um, and they had to not laugh, right? They had to, they had to keep a straight face while uh, what Sununu said, they were sometimes very body. Uh, limericks, um, and so I think that that is a story you just can't you can't forget, right? That that someone who even while you're engaged in very high level conversations uh, manages to keep it light and memorable for for his top aides, and their enormous regret is that um, Sununu's was that he destroyed those notes immediately because didn't want anyone ever seeing them, and now he wishes that they were still around. Yeah. You can see former President George W. Bush there on locomotive 4141, which has stopped in College Station. And we, we heard some, some of the crowd even cheering as, as the train rolled to a stop. Um, we'll see the Bush family get off the train and uh, get prepared to enter vehicles. Um, still more of this uh, ceremony and tradition to come. And th there was that window on the train so that as it rolled by, people in Texas could pay their respects. Uh, they could wave to the Bush family, but they could also see the casket as it passed. Bob Costa, the legacy that is being talked about so much this week uh, feels like a contrast to politics of today in a lot of ways, but it also does remind us of, of the history of the Republican Party and the history of what it means to be commander in chief in this country over the last few decades. Do you feel like this conversation is enlightening us or, or elevating our, our sort of discussion in this fractured political moment right now? Yes and no. I hope he rests in peace and he was a good man and clearly a good family man. Many Americans thought he was a good president, but like any politician, he has taken actions in his uh, past that continue to raise political debate. Uh, whether it was in the 1988 campaign and how he handled the outside ads done about Willie Horton, uh, how he handled different domestic issues as president, even criticism from the right about how he handled the economy and Newt Gingrich used to clash with uh, then-President Bush during the early 1990s about tax increases. And so you have uh, right now, I think, a lot of talk and admiration, rightfully so, about President Bush's class, his grace as a president and as a man and as a family man. But his political record uh, will be debated for years, or if not decades, to come. Uh, this is someone who was at such a high popularity level during the Gulf War. Uh, yet not able to win re-election in 1992, in part maybe not even his own fault. A lot of history looks back. The country really after 12 years of Reagan Bush was ready to move on regardless of what, how well uh, the country appreciated. The country liked President George H.W. Bush even in 1992. If you look at polling about his favorability, he was never seen in a negative light, any kind of scandal. Uh, but it's always hard for a vice president to follow uh, a president who's a two-termer. We rarely see it really in American history. And I think he suffered in 92 in part because of that. I, I would agree with that. I mean, Martin Van Buren is the only only other fellow that pulled it off. And uh, by 92, uh, unlike the campaign Dukakis ran, uh, the Clintons ran a very smart change-oriented campaign. And, you know, by then, a fourth term of Reagan Bush was a tough mountain to it, climb. It kind of reminds me of uh, John Major in the UK following Thatcher for the Conservative Party. And then Tony Blair has this opportunity to come in as this new Democrat, new generation, just like Bill Clinton. Sometimes the winds of history, it's hard to surmount. 
Were the seeds of the current Republican Party sown during this administration, the administration of George H.W. Bush, in, in the sense that he did make compromises with Democrats? He made a no new taxes pledge and then uh, had to move back on that based on his own reading of the economy and the political uh, realities at hand. And as you point out, Bob, that created a real backlash among a conservative element of the Republican Party. Did, was there a lesson learned that compromise is not the way to go? I think so. I mean, on domestic issues, you've always had that Bush wing trying to ever since cut deals. The president, George W. Bush, made sure he seemed more conservative because of c concerns about how his father's legacy was viewed. But I think President George H.W. Bush's Republican Party is vastly different from the modern Republican Party in foreign policy. The way he, President Bush talked about the new world order, talked about international alliances, the way he went to so many allies to try to work on the Gulf War as a, 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 not a unilateral project, but a project involving many nations. It's just v totally different than the nationalism that's articulated by President Trump. Something that comes uh, alive in his writing is the importance he placed on personal relationships with other world leaders. You know, that was just paramount to him. He and Kissinger would get into these little tiffs because Kissinger would say that, uh, you know, nothing can substitute sort of like clear national interests. Um, but for him, it was all about building, forging those individual relationships. You know, like he liked, um, you know, François Mitterrand. He, his great regret was that he was never as close to Thatcher as Reagan had been, right? Um, but, uh, you know, he felt that his personal relationship with Gorbachev was incredibly important. You know, like I, I knew his heartbeat, right? It reminded, you know, it, mm -hmm. it echoes what, what years later George W. Bush would say that, you know, I, I looked into Putin's eyes Absolutely. and I saw his soul. Um, but to him, those were, those were the key. You know, and, and so he'd have them over at Kennebunkport, you know, like it would, it would be the sort of annual thing. Um, and so that, that to him um, was, was essential. And it, it does feel like, like such a contrast to the, the style of leadership uh, when it comes to, to foreign allies that, that we see today. And perhaps part of why we're talking so much about his character and, and personality is because that's also in contrast to the way people talk about the current president of the United States. I just want to pause here as we watch the casket unloaded from Locomotive 4141. Thank you. 
the Aggie War Hymn playing there right after Hail to the Chief. You're watching live coverage from the Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey and I'm joined by Tom Colmore and Carlos Lozada. Uh, here watching this uh, transfer process, one of the final transfers as we head towards the Presidential Library at Texas A&M. And you can see the Bush family there, their five surviving children, their spouses, grandchildren on hand. The military precision with which this is all done, Tom, is absolutely amazing. Well, it's quite remarkable. You know, when the president leaves office, the military district of Washington comes and visits them in their new office and says, you know, we need to plan for Really? Funeral. Wow. And uh, so a book is created and it's revised over the years as plans change or ideas come in. No matter but how old or young the president may be? No matter how wow. old or young, I can guarantee you that there is a book on each former president mm -hmm. and uh, their desires and, mm -hmm. and wishes. And uh, uh, it's a very personal uh, thing uh, to choose. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of different choices to make, let's just say. And uh, uh, this is uniquely George Bush to uh, be received by the Aggie Band, a band he loved and heard many, many times. And uh, uh, I'm sure it's a very poignant moment for the family because they've been at much happier occasions mm -hmm. with him where that band has performed. And now they're going to drive down Barbara Bush Drive to the George Bush Library where the interment will take place. Yeah. Nicole Ellis is live in College Station. Let's go to Nicole again. Hi, Libby. Yes, I could not agree more. This is absolutely a uniquely Bush proceeding, uh, especially with the Aggie bands uh, doing the Aggie War Hymn, which was actually written by Vernon Pinky Wilson, uh, an A&M alum from 1921. He actually wrote the song in 1918 while uh, stationed on the Rhine River in Germany during World War I. Uh, our colleague Carlos Lozada mentioned uh, limericks and writing sort of competitive, quippy songs, and, and this song is actually quite fitting of that as well. Uh, it was initially directed at University of Texas, my own parents alum actually. Um, and, and so it's it's a fight song intended to, to sort of instill fear in your competitors. And that's honestly something we know and heard so much about as Bush is not only an athletic competitor, but a competitor and, and a, has, has been known for his sharp elbows also in politics. Um, so we'll definitely be keeping, keeping an eye out for sort of other signature Bush, and not only Bush, but also Texas and, and passionate uh, sort of recollections and nods of that love of not only competition, uh, but of service and of, of city and state and Texas. Yeah. Uh, Libby will be keeping an eye on you. I'm sure if you can see the visuals, I'm sure the cadets are, are lined up as the motorcade comes down uh, Barbara Bush uh, roadway here. And, and again, another nod to A&M and another nod to Barbara, because this is not unfamiliar as they did this for her as well. Uh, so we'll definitely be keeping you in the loop as things unfold here and, and you know, take in this very emotional moment uh, as we put him to rest in his final resting place alongside Barbara and his daughter Robin. Back to you, Libby. Thank you, Nicole. For those of us who have not yet been to this library, tell us about it, Tom. Well, there's a, a, a great uh, exhibit of uh, the president's life and Mrs. Bush's life, and it begins with a red Studebaker, which is the car they drove from New Haven down to Odessa, Texas, when they made the big decision <laughs> to not follow the life of privilege on Wall Street that was sort of preordained, but to rather go to the dusty oil fields of Texas. And uh, it follows the president's career from there, all of the uh, assignments he took for the government. And uh, there's a, an Oval Office, um, it's sort of a miniature Oval Office, but more importantly, there's a big uh, um, uh, presentation on Desert Storm and a replica of his office at Camp David, where he spent as much time as he could. He loved Camp David. It gave him the freedom to recreate that's a, a verb he created, <laughs> recreate. Um, and uh, every weekend was filled with guests and activities and competitions, but also just like every other day of his presidency, up at 5 or 5.30 and working for several hours in, the, in that little office. So. Carlos, this is so much about protocol and tradition. Uh, you've been exploring how George Bush felt about protocol and, and how he, he certainly observed it and acknowledged it, but he also did what he felt was right. Yes, uh, in in his in his diaries uh, and and these these books we've been talking about, 
um, you see how even in moments of, of crisis, his sense of, of propriety uh, really uh, plays a big role. Um, when there was the assassination attempt against President Reagan, uh, which was very early in, in Bush's time as, as vice president, um, you know, he was, I believe he was actually flying back from, from Texas. Uh, and his, his military aides, you know, once, they, once they, they landed nearby, wanted to sort of helicopter him directly to, to the White House. And, you know, for a moment he thought about how that would look, you know, and it's like, well, it looks very commanding and powerful, you know, landing mm. at the White House and striding into the Oval Office. And, um, and he declined. He wanted to be taken to the vice president's residence and then driven uh, to the White House. And his perplexed military aide uh, can't believe it. And he finally just says, only the president lands on the South Lawn, right? That was, you know, even in that moment, um, you know, as, as, as high a crisis moment as you can have for a, a new vice president, that sense of propriety, uh, you know, over, over, you know, was overriding everything else. Um, another moment that I, that I recall is when um, President Johnson, speaking of Texas, President Johnson was... Such a Texan. I mean, I, uh, like, yeah. like Texas, right? Completely Texas, yeah. right? All Texas, is, as, as big as Texas. Mm -hmm. When President Johnson um, was departing, uh, rather than attend Nixon's inauguration festivities... As any uh, good Republican would be exactly, expected to do. Uh, uh, George H.W. Bush was the only Republican to go to Andrews Air Force Base and, and see uh, Johnson off, you know? And he, he reflects in his diaries about how here was a man who, you know, had been, you know, walking through the crowds, you know, glad-handing, you know, everyone, and now was, was leaving in some ways broken, broken by, by Vietnam. And so he, he's there, shakes his hand on the way out. Johnson starts walking away and then looks back and just says, thank you for coming. You know, it's interesting. Uh, someone, I think, in the funeral yesterday mentioned the science of personal relationships. And that moment led to when the president ran for the Senate in Texas in 1970, he, went, he was invited down to the Johnson Ranch hmm. for an afternoon with the leader of the opposition, if you will, uh, not for an endorsement, of course, but for a nice discussion. Now, that wouldn't have happened except for that gesture that he had made. You're seeing live footage from College Station, Texas, at Texas A&M. And this is the site of the Presidential Library, and that is where uh, we'll see final internment later on this evening in, in, a, in a private ceremony, Tom. So much of this has been public, but that will be uh, private for the family. And the body of the former president, George H.W. Bush, will lie next to his wife, Barbara Bush, and their three-year-old daughter, Robin, who died of leukemia as a child. What's the significance of having these three spend eternity together in this location and Barbara Bush having passed away just seven months ago? Well, you know, they moved Robin's grave mm -hmm. when, when they built the library and created this burial plot from, um, I believe it was in Connecticut, uh, down here. And uh, um, it means the world to them to be back together. I know that for sure. There have been some beautiful cartoons depicting the three of them being reunited in heaven, and it's, it's uh, quite moving to see those. Interestingly... And that, and the moment that really broke up George W. Bush yesterday as he was ending his eulogy and talking about thinking of the three of them. Well, and you know, Robin was never far from President Bush's heart or thoughts. And uh, he kept a small picture of her on his desk all his life. Still on his desk in Houston. To this day, I'm sure it's sitting there. And... Uh, um, that was a, a life-changing event, as it would be for anyone to lose a young child. And uh, it, it tempered him, and uh, much like being shot down uh, in the Pacific, I think, you yeah, know, it was a little bit of why us, but now there must be something bigger meant for us, and we need to work harder. Does that come across in the President's writings and reflections? It does. In a, in a letter he wrote to his own mother, uh, maybe two or three years after, after Robin's death, uh, he talked about the, the longing that he and Barbara still, like the physical longing he and Barbara still felt for her every day. Uh, and I'll just, I'll just read the line. Mm -hmm. He says to her, we need her and yet we have her. We can't touch her and yet we can feel her. We hope she'll stay in our house for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, this is a man who, uh, who was criticized for 
his lack of eloquence. And I can't imagine um, a, more, a more touching way to describe the, the enduring absence of a child. It speaks to the fact that family, indeed, was the centerpiece of his life. And uh, just the way that uh, you've seen the grandchildren uh, participate in these two services now, uh, it would just warm his heart. What did it mean for him to see his son ascend to the presidency? Uh, the proudest father on the planet. And it wasn't about the politics or the policy, mm -hmm. it was about being a proud father, truly. Do you think he could separate that out from the defeat he suffered oh, in 92? And well, it, it, it helped him rationalize the defeat mm -hmm. because he often articulated, and I think it's probably pretty true, that if he'd been reelected, his son probably wouldn't have become president. And uh, so. You were at the National Cathedral yesterday mm -hmm. um, for um, the funeral, uh, state funeral. What was it like to be there just as a person and as someone who worked in the Bush administration? Oh, it was overwhelming. Uh, it was a beautiful ceremony. You know, our country does that sort of thing extremely well, as it should. Um, but it was also a personal ceremony. I mean, there was enough laced in there, all the planning that goes into it. Uh, the eulogies sort of built on each other, I thought. Uh, Dr. Levinson made it particularly personal as his personal pastor from from Houston, um, as he did today again. Um, and it was refreshing to see all of official Washington come together for that moment, uh, as they did for Ford's funeral and Reagan's funeral. And, and it's sort of a great tradition we have. Did it feel like a coming together inside National Cathedral? Oh, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, uh, one group that the president wanted together was all the former directors of the CIA. Hmm. And, you know, that. That, that's quite a bipartisan group right there, when you think about it. Leon Panetta and uh, uh, John Brennan uh, uh, sitting there with uh, those who served under Republican presidents, right? So. He was only director for about a year, and yeah. yet it became such an important... It's a consequential uh, year, though. Part of, yes, yes, and, yeah. and it's, the, it's the George H.W. Bush uh, Center for Intelligence, right? Yeah. It's, yes. Um, and at one moment, he gave... Um, he gave a speech where he addressed the, the staff of the, of the agency. And um, there was a line in it that just feels so apropos or so necessary to hear again today. He writes, it is not fashionable in these days of tearing down our institutions to say, trust me. Hmm. Yet Americans have to have faith and trust in some degree or none of our governmental systems will work. You know, he, he, he did believe in in sort of leadership as its own end, you know, rather than 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 focus in a in a you know in a vital way on on this particular policy or this ideology, um, he had a, a sense of just steady leadership of America out front, um, you know, in in charge in in kind of key moments. And that notion of simply trusting is one that's a little harder to come by um, these days. If yesterday felt at National Cathedral like like this this moment of coming together, um, it's, it says something. One, one of my, my former colleagues, Susan Glasser, wrote in The New Yorker that, that it's, it says something about Washington today that uh, our, our only feel-good moments uh, tend to be funer funerals. Like the lowest moments, right. And, right. And, and those are these rare moments mm -hmm. of, of coming together. And, and in a sense, that's part of what is being mourned, right? It's not solely the, the life and the record and the presidency of George H.W. Bush, um, but also uh, a, a certain style of, of leadership, a certain approach to leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's, it's hard to disaggregate all those things right now and, and all those different emotions. He worked hard to connect himself to the people on the front line doing the work. He knew the names of his daily briefers from the CIA. He would get a briefing paper for a foreign trip and he'd call up the desk officer at the State Department and ask more questions. <laughs> he wanted that connection. He wanted to make sure they knew their work was appreciated and valued. What did he make of the, the Washington of today, and the political climate of today? Oh, I, I don't think he was too judgmental. Um, I, I think he, uh, you know, troubled by troubled times, but, uh, you know, he understands how hard these jobs are and uh, always understood that. 
there's a moment in, in one of his books where uh, one of his last tasks as CIA director was to uh, brief President-elect Carter on some of the sort of long-term threats to national security. And at one point, he, uh, he and one of his colleagues are going through some issues that could come to a head in the, in the mid-1980s. And Carter holds up his hand and says, ah, that won't be my problem. Um, by then, George Bush here, he can take care of it, right? And of course, this is before he's running for president, before, before any of this. And, uh, and Bush writes in his, in his diary, um, you know, Bush can take care of it. I, I wonder what he meant by that, right? Like a um, but but there. of course, yeah. of, of course he knew. I mean, he had this, this sense uh, from very early on that he was someone who was, who was uh, destined to do big things. Um, and part of it flowed from, and, and this is something that I think John Meacham hit on yesterday, um, that part of this flowed precisely from that sense of, 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 of having received much, you know, that, that he felt he had a debt to pay. This was something that the Bush people did. Um, and, and so for him, you know, he always had his eye you know, looking forward on that. So uh, He also so. came from an era and a class where the doors were open for him. And so someone of his pedigree, of his background, of his wealth could say, I, I have my eyes on that. I have my eyes on that goal. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be unrealistic Absolutely. at all, right? Yeah. So you can see that the hearse is arriving at the presidential library. S everything is done with significance, Tom. E everything from the design of this space at Texas A&M to uh, the arrival. Can you tell us what we're looking at here now? So on the, on the right of the hearse is the library itself, where the museum exhibits are and the National Archive records uh, reside. And on the left, which you can't see right now, is a building that houses the Bush School of Government and service, government public policy, and also uh, uh, the president's private apartment where he would stay when, when he was in College Station. Uh, so the school and the, the history piece of the library come together uh, right there in that courtyard where they have just driven. And the burial plot is just a few hundred yards down the sidewalk that they're now arriving at. There'll soon be a new building added there where a Marine One helicopter will, will be in a glass building, which will be uh, kind of majestic as well. We've been hear hearing hail to the chief whenever there's this transfer. You're going to hear it again. And so we'll hear that again, perhaps for the last time, Tom? I think so. Yeah. It's got to mean so much to George W. Bush to hear that. He heard this a lot when his father was president, when he was president, in a lot of joyful, triumphant moments. Uh, now it's taken on, I'm sure, a whole new meaning and complexity to him yes. as he's heard it performed for his father. We'll hear Hail to the Chief, the National Anthem. Also, the U.S. Navy will conduct a 21-strike fighter aircraft flyover. And the third aircraft in the final flight will execute the missing man maneuver, mm. uh, which is especially significant for this president. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, he's still thought of every day, as you know, and have read about those two crewmen he lost when he was shot down in World War II. Carlos, was that something he wrote much about? Uh, he did. Uh, you see it come alive a lot in in the letters um, that he that he wrote. Uh, so essentially, he was he was rescued by by a U.S. sub, the the USS Finback. Um, but he had to spend, I believe, several weeks uh, on board before he could he could you know return to his uh, to his ship and his crew. And so he spent a lot of that time writing letters, including to uh, to his parents mainly. Um, and he says then that he, you know, I, I still don't understand the logic of war, why some survive and why some are lost in their prime. Uh, and he was thinking about his two comrades uh, who, whom, whom he lost that day, um, and of course other, other, other aviators as well. It, uh, um, I think, really tempered his decision making as president as well, whether it was for Panama or Desert Storm, you know, it's obviously the weightiest decision a commander in chief can make to send troops into harm's way. But having been there himself, it, it made him really think hard. 
and ask tough questions. You can see the Bush family there. George W. Bush and, and Laura Bush, the former first lady, really leading the way in all of these in all of these movements. Well, he's the new patriarch of the family, and uh, uh, this is obviously a time that weighs heavily on him. Uh, you've seen Mrs. Bush kind of holding him up a bit, mm -hmm. and uh, don't discount the role that General Howard there has played the, uh, from the military district of Washington. A, a phenomenal job on behalf of the country, uh, saluting this president and. Uh, orchestrating these uh, salutes.
From here, the internment of former President George H.W. Bush is private. Here at Texas A&M at the Presidential Library, what we do expect to happen is a 21-gun salute, uh, the playing of taps, um, and the flag uh, that is draping the casket will be presented uh, to his daughter, his one surviving daughter, Doro. 
We're watching the Bush family go over this bridge. Uh, Tom, tell us about this location. Well, first, I just have to say this is an emotional moment. Um, for anyone who had the privilege and honor of knowing this great man, uh, this is truly the end of the road, and uh, it's a beautiful ceremony. Uh, it is a location, as you can see, just across a, a lake from the library complex, and uh, will be easily reachable by uh, tourists and visitors who would like to come pay their respects. Uh, and it's a pond where the president used to take his fishing pole out take the grandkids over and see what he could get and uh, it's a very peaceful place. Uh, Mrs. Bush had a lot to do with the uh, landscape design as well and the flowers and plantings around the area so it's a it's a personal place too. The tie you're wearing is a 41 tie. It is, it's a 41 foundation tie. Mm -hmm. uh, we made these up on the 25th anniversary of the library actually. Mm -hmm. This will be the end, ultimately, for the Bush family of these many days of mourning. Their process of grief and memory goes on, of course, as they think about their father, their grandfather. Uh, so many of them have talked about what a, what a leader he was and a mentor he was for them. Uh, but this has got to have been an exhausting handful of days for them, and now a moment of privacy. I, I think it's very appropriate. I'm sure they're physically and mentally exhausted, but they're also lifted up. We had. Uh, uh, his son Neil uh, to an alumni reception the other night before the funeral and uh, they're they're getting their energy they're feeding off of all of the tributes and all of the beautiful essays and op-eds that have been written and uh, uh, it's 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 quite nice for them certainly on what a personal basis. You know, what was it like to have a reunion of so many people come together here in DC earlier it, this week? It was like a big Irish wake. Yeah. <laughs> I mean it was 500 people from cabinet officers and chiefs of staff to advance folks and staff assistants and everything in between and uh, uh, it was a great opportunity for lots of clusters of people who had worked so hard together many years ago to come together and tell old war stories and that's exactly what they did the stories got bigger and better as the <laughs> night went on Carlos what does America lose at this moment and, and what does America gain you know I, I've been I've been thinking about what you just mentioned, Tom, about the, the, the emotion of the moment. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, it's so sober and, and, and proper. And I think um, that's not a bad metaphor for um, uh, his presidency, for George H.W. Bush's presidency. When, when you think of all the, the huge transformations that were underway in the world at the time, um, and yet, um, as, he, as he writes in his diaries, his, his main concern is that it would happen uh, without backlash, without drama. You know, the, the fall of the Soviet Union, the, the, the opening of, of Europe, the you know, coming down of the Berlin Wall, that was his greatest pride, was that he was able to manage it, not by spiking the football, not by running to Berlin to, to, to celebrate. Um, and and he, he was criticized for that at the time. You know, why aren't you showing more emotion? Why, um, you know, aren't you excited by this? And of course, in his mind, he's running through all the things that, that could have gone wrong. But when he looked back on it um, in, his, in his book with, with Brent Scowcroft, uh, that's what, what he, was, he was proud about, that it came off without drama. Uh, he was no drama before, before Obama was, was no drama. Um, <laughs> well and, and I think that's, that's one of the things that um, is easy to take for granted. And that we're, we're, you know, when we look back on that now, it's like, oh, well, that's how history unfolded, right? It, it didn't have to. Mm -hmm. you know, he, he helped it unfold in, in that way. Um, and I think that that sense of steady leadership, that 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 very sober leadership, uh, is is something that we're we're losing now, and and you know in a way is is part of this mourning process. Let's go one last time to Nicole Ellis, who's at Texas A&M outside the Presidential Library. Nicole. Thank you, Libby. Truly an emotional moment here as the planes flew by. It's safe to say that, you know, honestly, no one could hear their heartbeat, let alone a pin drop beyond that. Um, something that I think, you know, I'd, I'd love to sort of leave you with in these last moments as people reflect and, and part their ways here is, uh, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about the heroism of President Bush and, and his 
his time as one of the youngest naval pilots uh, of, at the time when he was just 18 years old. Um, and most, like most other pilots, uh, he named his planes. Uh, he had three planes. Uh, the first, Barbara One, uh, was lost in training. The second, uh, Barbara Two, went down on enemy fire. And the third, Barbara Three, was, uh, was lost September 2nd, 1944, uh, a day we've discussed frequently when he narrowly escaped capture, unlike his comrades and inevitable death that, that they met. Um, it's safe to say that today, uh, you know, while the planes may have names, the only one that matters to him is the Barbara that he is joining today. Um, thank you so much, Libby. Everyone here is is truly taking this moment in and, and trying to be as respectful as we can to the family as they mourn and have that first opportunity, as as your guests mentioned, to, to truly have a personal moment and, and just celebrate his life. Um, thank you again, Libby. Back to you. Thanks, Nicole. That aerial flyover, so significant when you're talking about someone who served as a pilot, Carlos. Right. You see, you see flyovers, yeah. you know, at, 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 at sporting events and at different things. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite different when, uh, when you recall um, uh, his own service and, uh, and, the, and the heroism uh, that he showed and the risks that he took uh, as a very young man in, uh, you know, the, the first of many times he served his country. Tom, final thoughts from you? Oh, uh, it's hard to... Sum it all up. It was the honor of a lifetime to know this great man for 40 years. And uh, I think about the people that got to see him on, on that train trip. And they're going to remember that the rest of their lives. And I think that's pretty special. And he'd be pretty pleased about that. As well as the thousands of people who paid their respects um, overnight in Texas and Houston at St. Martin's and the more than 50,000 who were able to pay their respects here in Washington. You know, when he first. Uh, it was first proposed that he lie in state. He asked his staff, well, do you think anyone will come? Mm. Wow. Yeah. Well, Tom Collimore served uh, in the Bush administration. He's now with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and he's on the board of this library, the, the George Bush Presidential Library and Museum uh, in Texas and College Station at A&M. Uh, I think we've all learned a lot about uh, the library today through this process as well. So, yeah, thank you so much. Carlos Lozada, nonfiction book critic here at The Post. Um, you can read a piece that he wrote about George Bush's writings and the memoir that you wish that he had written, but um, his, his writings really do come to life, and your, your, uh, your article brings so much of that to the fore. So thanks so much for spending time with thank us you. today. And thank you for watching. We'll leave you with these images here outside of the, the library. Um, our coverage uh, has been ongoing for the last few days as we've been joining the nation in the celebration and mourning of the 41st president of the United States. I'm Libby Casey. Thank you for watching our Washington Post broadcast. And if you subscribe, you'll get notifications about future news events and productions we do in the future. Thanks so much.
guess we can uh, 